it is 6.30 and I will call the meeting to order. And for starters, uh, we have two uh, council members participating remotely. I ask them to uh, introduce themselves. Hi, good evening. This is Adrian Gill, District 1. Hi, everyone. Lauren Hurl, District 1. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll mention a bit about meeting logistics and remote instructions. Anyone who's appearing uh, remotely, I would ask you to change your uh, name display to your uh, full first and last name so that we know who we're talking to. Um, anyone who wishes to address the council must be uh, recognized. We could ask you to uh, keep your comments to three minutes and we will uh, have um, the assistance of our communications director in, uh, in reminding you of the time. And uh, with that, uh, we'd ask if there's a motion to approve the agenda or if people are satisfied with the agenda as it's written. Uh, Mr. Mayor? Yes. There's a couple of notes on the agenda. One is for those that may have noticed that there had originally been a presentation from downtown businesses that has been removed. They're uh, asked to have that uh, taken up on June 26th at our next meeting. So that will not be happening tonight. Um, minor adjustment, I'd like to suggest moving the communication strategic plan item in with the administration uh, overview. That's when it was supposed to be been, not after the strategic plan, just so that it's lumped together and then, okay, no. then do the strategic plan. Um, under the parklet fee waiver, second reading, we have on there uh, approving the ordinance. We don't necessarily have to do this tonight, but it might be helpful if we then add, if, assuming that passes, um, that we then actually take a motion and vote to waive the fee this mm -hmm. year once the ordinance has been passed so that that's just taken care of. And then um, just lastly, for your consideration, we had planned to do the strategic plan item as a workshop around the table, but with, you know, I, we, we have two people remote, so you just may want to think about that. That was something we had talked about in the retreat and it's up to you, but just might be less easy to do. Yeah, I agree with that. Thank you. Um, and I also note that we did have, in the published agenda, uh, an applicant for the tree board who's withdrawn the name. So that's off the agenda for tonight. And so we'll proceed with the agenda as, uh, as amended, unless there's any objection from the council. Okay. We can go to, um, general business and appearances. This is an opportunity for any member of the public to address the council on any topic that is not on tonight's agenda. Um, as always, we ask, your, ask you to keep your comments to three minutes and we'll start by seeing if there's anyone in the room who'd like to be uh, recognized. Steve, why don't you come on up? Um, Steve Whitaker couple of things uh an encamp an encampment that the city council had blessed back at a meeting in the winter in the high school was removed last week uh there's a new policy by vtrans that lays out their process but nobody delineated where the city owned land from the state owned right of way is the campers were right at the border between the, the the city's parcel maps show that parcel being from the first, I think the second tree to the first tree to the third tree. In any case, without getting into the graphics, no one bothered to say this is city owned land. If you just be right there, you're okay. But instead they destroyed whatever with a big claw hook and a dump truck and uh, trespass notices and yada, yada, yada. And our police department was involved in it. I reviewed all the emails at VTrans. Um, I think it merits attention and discussion, especially in that the city council had 
I'm not saying they were good housekeepers or houseless keepers or whatever you call them, but uh, that's a problem. Uh, the I should I'll I'll just jump in and say that I it might be going a little too far to say the council blessed their presence, but when we we're request confronted with a request to remove them, nobody on the council is willing to do that. But you know, yeah, okay, that's that's fair enough. Uh, that didn't come out of my two minutes, right? Right. Uh, uh, so, oh, it's three, Steve. But no, the right. the the mattress that was thrown down the bank has not been retrieved. The tires that have been down the bank, uh, the shopping cart that I've been telling you about for three years has not been removed from easily reach. So we put this sustainable, environmental, responsible on our agenda and we don't walk the talk we uh i wonder if the council needs a method to require that these vigorous notes that bill takes go somewhere and be accountable for response and action and completed because a bunch of notes scribbles that never nothing ever happens is ineffective and i think this council aspires to be more effective than that um I think the council should know that when I, I'm requesting, and I'll do it in writing, I'm requesting that the harassment around the boot and the tickets and the dysfunction in the city's ability to process appeals for tickets, uh, my car was booted, I copied y'all in the complaints, uh, Bill was out of town that week, I prevailed in getting the boot taken off, but we still haven't resolved the dysfunction in the appeal process. And that should not wait on a ordinance revision, you know, this fall or summer. This needs to be heard. You need, I'm gonna ask that you potentially go into executive session and look at the emails and see how they're targeted at me or how they acknowledge the dysfunction in the appeals process and consider waiving privilege on those. Uh, Fraser has, a, refused an appeal to the head of the agency and probably didn't even ask y'all whether you want to consider waiving privilege. But to the degree that they're, they're targeted at me and that they acknowledge the dysfunction in the ordinance, then they they deserve to be public. Um, but then at the end of the week in Shaw's, Frazier, I said, Frazier, are you, are you back on the clock? You know, I didn't say Frazier. I said, Bill, are you back on the clock? And he, in front of a bunch of people in the produce section, snaps at me. Why should I even talk to you? You don't live here. You don't pay any taxes here. And the, and and finish your sentence. And and then he he even followed me back. Came back around again and said, "You're going to hit up a city employee for you know for food." I was once a couple dollars short, and I you know borrowed a few dollars for to complete my chicken. But the, to shame someone for food or to create a scene where these people are looking around in the shahs and saying, who the hell is he? And why is he talking to you that way? You know, that's the, that's the dysfunction we have in our administration right now. Okay. Thank you. Is there anybody, did you want to, is there anybody else in the room who'd like to be uh, recognized? Sandy, come on up. Hi. Hi, everybody. Um, uh, my name is Sandy Vitztum. I live at 14 Loomis Street, and I'm an architect who grew up in Montpelier. And really, most of my adult life, I've been very interested in trying to make houses more affordable. I noticed that um, it's it's the problems getting worse in the last five years. Um. I, about two years ago, uh, created the little drawing that you see as I was trying to figure out how to take advantage of our zoning to deal with the land part of the equation and starting to think about how the house construction could figure in. And um, uh, I really firmly believe that small houses on small lots might be a way forward. Um, I took it upon myself to make this drawing of 
just to, to see what would happen if I tried laying out a similar kind of development on the um, country club property. And I was able to get uh, about 330 units uh, on that, which is interesting because it begins to open questions of what other kinds of development on the property might um, serve the same number of families. And this is just a beginning exploration. Um, I'm I'm trying to make sure that a house owning a house in this on a small lot like this. Um, would be less than rent in its total monthly expenses, which is quite a challenge. And I'm starting to examine that now for a one bedroom, a two bedroom and a three bedroom house. And um, this is gonna take some time, but I just wanted to let the city council know I've been exploring these ideas because I'd like to start talking to um, some banks in the, in the area and learn about how the how fi financing incentives work for small houses. And I didn't feel comfortable taking my ideas um, to, around the community without first introducing them here. So I'm not asking for any any endorsement or anything like that. It's just I wanted to share my preliminary ideas with you so that um, if something can move forward in the fall or next year, that it will be always collaborative and uh, hopefully helpful. Well, so, thank you for bringing this yes. in. I've uh, I've heard that you were going to be talking to us about this. I'll hold this up to my yeah. camera. I, I, I don't know if people can, can I didn't see know this. how to get this to you. Okay, yeah. Um, just as a general, this will be going, uh, we'll, we'll have a copy, we'll have it on the web page. Um, is, is the area covered by uh, houses in, in your drawing, essentially the same as the area that uh, we've been talking about for housing in the it's, parcel? It's almost precisely the same. Thank you for doing that. Oh, excellent. Um, um, and uh, for holding it up. Um, so it's almost precisely the same by having little houses, they can go a little further into the woods. Um, but yeah, it's pretty much identical. Um, the planners that you hired did a really good job of analyzing what's buildable. And I myself looked at the USGS map to make sure they were slopes that were usable. Great. Thanks. Thank you so no, much. There's a lot going on. We've yeah. uh, put in the application for the growth amended growth center designation. And so we're, that's a step in turn to our doing the engineering and doing the, uh, uh, the TIF district. So it's a lot of this stuff is a ways down the road, but I appreciate your doing this. I'll be back in when I have some more facts. Okay. Sure. Thanks. Thank um, anybody else? If you're, if you're here to speak, come on up. Oh, well, if you're here to talk about the ordinance, then we'll just wait. Yeah. And I'll just look is to see if there's anyone. Just thinking about a previous agenda, we had um, increasing our fees for public records and, and our policy. Um, we didn't really discuss it. It feels like maybe that's something we should put on a future agenda to review. Sure. So just request that at this point. Oh, great. Yeah, you know, there. I saw an email from the city clerk about uh, a question of parliamentary procedure, and it wasn't clear to me what the background for that was. So, so yeah, we'll get that on the agenda. Thanks. All right. We can now move to the... I don't see anyone else in the room seeking to be recognized, and I didn't see anyone online. So we're we're now to the consent agenda. Um, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. And is there a second? Second. Okay. It's moved and seconded. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Thank you. 
now we have an, a, pro, a proposal for or an application to the Development Review Board. And I believe this is an application for someone who's already on the Development Review Board to be reappointed. Yeah, I'm going to finding that uh, spot right here. Uh, Catherine Burgess. What's your pleasure? Would you like someone want to make a motion to appoint her or we go into executive session? Carrie. We appoint Catherine Burgess to the um, design review board. So. Any discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, sorry? Well, Development Review, or, yep. Yeah, it's, it's the Development Review Board and the Design Review Committee, and they're two different things, although it is kind of confusing. All right, uh, it's uh, moved and passed, and and she is appointed. Thank you. Now we're up to Peter Walk, and I was talking to someone just today who was very excited about this. Peter and Arnie together? I'm Marty from the Recreation Department. Um, we've been thinking about, you know, ideas for a potential disc golf course now for quite a while. And Peter approached us, and I think um, Christopher Young, I think, was also one who we had met with once earlier about the potential of a course up there. And then Peter and the and Christopher and Bradley all worked together and we met up at country club road and did a walk of the space and they were very excited about the potential that this space would have for a disc golf course up there one of the things we were going to try to do in um april was we were gonna they had a tournament they were going to set up there for a weekend tournament and <clears throat> i went online and i learned that they had 90 slots for this tournament and they were all filled that between professionals and some advanced players. And I think what was the other level, like begin recreational level, recreational level. So there was many, many levels. Unfortunately, we got that big snowstorm right before the event. So they, they couldn't get the baskets set up and they had to cancel, but this, they came forward with a proposal for us on a plan that we could make this, a possibility and I'm going to have Peter um, walk you through it because I think it's a really awesome proposal and I'm very excited about the potential. Sure. Uh, thank you for having me. My name is Peter Walk. Uh, I'm a resident of Montpelier. I live up on Terrace Street. Uh, happy to be with you. I think the last time I was here we were talking about PCBs in schools or something slightly less uh, exciting as this opportunity. So uh, excited to be here with you. Um, what uh, what Arnie said is is all true. Um, this was something uh, that after the tournament wasn't able to happen in April, quickly pivoted to what could we do to to make this an opportunity, look at the property, understand how it fits with the current uses and the planned uses for the property and uh, where we move forward. The nice piece about a disc golf course is that it pretty much the extent of the infrastructure is that basket there and a flat area for a tea, something to throw off of, like a tee pad in golf uh, that can be moved, that can be changed and a, and a sign, and that's about it. And so as the use of the property changes, there's real opportunity to morph with it. Um, there's a lot of woods on the property that really doesn't have development potential as you've seen as, as your housing consultant looked at, but I, I, we don't need housing level development land to uh, throw a Frisbee across. 
Uh, so there's great opportunity here to think about that and to think about what's possible now and then what it might be able to change to. Um, many of the disc golf courses that get built in this country and abroad are sponsored by uh, the local community, and we have sponsorship money to pay for the full cost of construction. So there'd be no upfront cost to the city in terms of putting this into place. So we'll start there. Um, so I just, you know, I made this a full and complete uh, presentation so folks could could read it online. Obviously, lots of good things in the work. Housing is what we need. You heard you heard that uh, from our previous speaker. Uh, very excited to mesh within that work, really thinking about how we can integrate with the community zone that's planned, the playing fields, walking as that's happening, the Nordic trails. We've been in discussion, in talks with the the Nordic uh, or the Onion River Nordic folks to make sure that we don't put things where the trails normally are groomed, so that there's no conflict there. Um, trying to figure out how to engage in a way that's really meaningful moving forward. Uh, disc golf itself is a really low impact recreational opportunity. Um, it has become a big economic driver for uh, different parts of Vermont. Uh, the two courses at Smuggler's Notch, for example, are the number, I think, believe number five and number seven courses in the world. They attract thousands of visitors each year. Last year, they received a visitor from every state in the U.S., the District of Columbia, and 16 separate countries with more than 6,000 rounds, I believe, at each uh, course played. Uh, that is a pay for play course. Uh, it's it's only like 12 bucks to play, so it's pretty reasonable relative to the... Yeah. Ooh, there we, I think we're coming back. I, I promise I didn't do anything. Um, and it's really exciting. This, this property has that level of potential. The combination of woods and open fields and terrain and great, you know, old rock walls and things like that has it has a tremendous potential. Um, and so we really see this as a great opportunity. Why move forward now? You're looking for existing use for property in the interim before the um before the housing gets built. This is a great opportunity to use that open space now, and then we can adjust moving forward. Um we have already uh worked extensively with the rec department with arnie and with Heidi, uh uh two uh local folks involved in the disc golf community bradley shot and uh chris young who runs a, a program called disc golf vermont which runs tournaments throughout the state uh where usually about 150 to uh 300 people show up um e every other weekend throughout the summer uh people come from as far away as texas uh, for these tournaments, they are they are they are important, and they bring lots of folks into the local local economy. Um, and then we've already established a, a a limited liability corporation, an L three C, technically a low profit limited liability corporation, to manage the fundraising and payment of for services that would need to be done to build uh, the property, uh, or to build on the property, and will main and work with local volunteers to reduce the overall cost of construction and to make uh, it uh, it sustainable in the long run to help with that long-term maintenance. Um, so this is just an example of sort of, you know, looking at the property now, use your, your housing plan concept A as a map that everybody was familiar with. That sort of shaded area is the place that isn't currently being uh, utilized in any significant way. The the down to the bottom right is where you have the feast farm and the playing fields and other things. That's a lot of scope to build 18 holes of disc golf. A disc golf hole is about like a golf hole, but it's feet instead of yards. So, uh, you know, 250 foot par three rather than a 250 yard par three. So you can fit a lot more holes into that space. Uh, there's lots of, you know, good access. The, the woods to the West have great potential. There's already some open, um, uh, former logging roads and other things and where the trail is coming up and things like that. We can integrate with all those uses and, and make use of it. And then as it changes, right, depending on where you want to go, conceptually, you could use some of the property, you, you, some of the wooded areas to the right, kind of work your way across and be able to use that in much of a way. Still get some out in the open, still integrate with the parks and open space that are imagined as part of the property and uh, get a really professional disc golf course that attracts lots of local visitors and is a resource for the community. We imagine this, we, the fundraising that we did would fund three 
three different T pads for each hole. So a T pad defines how long the and you know the hole is. Just look with golf, you have your easier T pads and your harder T pads. And so with this, we could build a beginner level, an intermediate, and advanced right away. Um, and then disc golf courses have have you know we're scrappy uh, little recreationalists. We figure out how to fit in lots of different places. We integrate in parks and uh, in woods. You see it at uh, Wrightsville in and around uh, the beach area. Uh, there are great. There's a great one in in Barry through the Barrytown Forest and the walking trails over by Millstone. Um, it's a really it really integrates well. Uh, folks are responsible, and it's a it's a great way to bring people into the area. That's that's my presentation. So this is very cool. So what do you need from us tonight? I mean, so we have we we asked we reached out to you know, Arnie and said, what do, what do we need to move forward? We have the the money, the people ready to go, ready to start designing and working on it. We think we can have something in the ground by the end of, before the snow flies, so that we could really test this and start with a kind of cool opening tournament. Um, and in in discussion with Arnie and Kelly and others, was just you know we wanted to bring it to you for your approval to move forward. Anybody have questions, Terry? Yeah. Um. So, thank you. Um. I'm I'm not a disc golf player, but it looks like a great idea, and I like that it seems flexible, and um, you can put it in quickly. You can take it out. You can move it around, and so it's not going to stop us from doing other things there. So that's great. Um. So I have a couple questions. Um. Is it just open and free to anybody to use? at any time would it have certain hours would there be any kind of you know admission fee or anything like that so that that's actually really a question to be worked out with in conversations with the city it it's your resource so if you wanted to charge for it if we could facilitate the collection of 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 fees there's usually a five to ten dollar per round for a course of this nature you could do that there are also public courses that are free to play Okay. So that's a that I don't think we need to necessarily solve that tonight, but uh, that could be a discussion that you all have and to tell direct us what to do. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then one more question is about ongoing maintenance and what kind of costs we might expect at, for the city for that. Yeah, I, the maintenance I think is going to be mostly mowing around the tea areas mm -hmm. and the the basket areas, and then probably have some open fairway areas that would be you know kept. Uh, low enough so you can walk through it and not have to swim through tall grass. Um, <clears throat> but I don't think it'll be, you know, that overtaxing with the equipment that we have to use and how it's laid out will probably make it pretty easy to, to make pain. Any other questions from members of the council? Tim. The city would be made with the that we would be maintaining like the mowing and stuff, mm -hmm. but the uh, the um, disc golf group would also the plan is to have volunteers who would help with more of the ongoing, yeah. you know. Uh, yeah, if there need we need to rebuild, you know, something's getting overused or need to rebuild something that would be something that we would bring in uh, local volunteers to work on. That's a big area to clear. Or keep well, it's we're we're you know, we would be. <laughs> Ideally, sticking to the holes, places where there are just golf holes, we'd happily help, you know, where needed. Right. Uh, but there's lots of uh, local, re you know, Montpelier residents and others who would gladly lend a hand in making the property uh, shine. So, um, great idea. I like it quite a bit. I, I've never played disc golf, I play regular golf. Um, I like the idea of a 250 foot hole. <laughs> um, what about liability on a on a real golf golf ball course? There's a lot of fine print about what happens when your ball hits something or somebody. Um, a disc is pretty soft, but stuff happens. How do you how do you deal with that? Yeah, I mean we we're able to mitigate conflict pretty well by good signage, by people keeping their eyes open. Um, I. I don't have a specific answer for you how it's dealt with in other, you know, there are public courses in, you know, 10 or 15 other courses, other places around Vermont where the, you know, I think, I believe the 
you know, sort of the city is covered mm -hmm. through their normal insurance. You've got uses of the property now that, frankly, I find riskier than throwing a Frisbee. So. Any other, Tim, did you have another question? The question is, would you do, just looking at your sketches, does it make sense? Because you kind of got a, a first location and then you would move it and we go to develop it to a new part on the property. Would it make more sense just to set it all up where you're going to end up? I think the it, it, that's an option, and I think we would I think we would continue to explore. It would be a shame not to use those school open spaces while they're available. Every disc golf course I've ever played has evolved over time. It's part of the nature of it, because uh, they are usually sharing space with other uses and want to make sure that those aren't in conflict and and work through those pieces. Or you know people get better and you want to make a hole longer or more challenging or whatever. Um, and so it's all it's constantly shifting. I think it's worth doing. And, you know, given, you know, we don't necessarily know what your, you know, the final developer plans for the housing might be, I'd hate to miss out on, on something that might be open, uh, you know, if by not, you know, by doing that. So I think we can, we're, the, the communication around the plan and how to adapt uh, is a key one from my perspective, making it clear to everybody that this is step one and there'll be, you know, other steps along the way. Uh, to what, you know, quote unquote, final uh, layout looks like. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, Arnie, you man, uh, both of you mentioned about the tournament. Uh, have you considered uh, adding this to the rec 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 um, sorry, the summer camps and everything recreation center offers? Like yeah, we, a, we thought of doing... Um... Is there any plan about that? Yeah, we, we've thought of incorporating some camp potential, um, also setting up classes for people who want to do that. And then also we were talking about um, um, some club type activity where different clubs might play each other. My my daughter's future husband, he plays against another group and every other weekend, somebody else does the barbecue. So they go someplace, they play a round of disc golf with a, two teams, and then they barbecue afterwards. It could be active, yeah. all around the year. Okay, good. Yeah. All right. Any other questions from members of the council? Um, members of the public? Steve, you look maybe interested. Um, Steve Whitaker. Uh, I have... This is a good recreational use, but I have concerns about the way we're going about piecemeal planning uh, what to do in the interim. We know we've got large carrying costs, engineering, feasibility, due diligence, et cetera. I don't see that this one brings in revenue. There is discussion with state officials and some local officials about uh, addressing our emergency housing uh, situation there with state support and I would, it shouldn't be a race to see who gets there first and precludes other uses. I think that this may well fit in with an integrated plan, but it should not move to the front of the line. I was a little concerned when the farm went in for the same reason. Uh, the farm was not discussed or anticipated with an eye towards uh, an integrated plan for year one, year two, year three, year four, whenever we're going to be ready to start turning it over to a developer. Um, I'm a little concerned the difference between sticking a stake and a basket in the ground. And I hear building construction and I don't know if just driving the basket in the ground is what he means by construction. But if, if it's more than that and volunteers coming into repair, I don't see how a basket gets much of a repair if it, if it falls apart, you put drive a new one in. But um, I just think that we need to be careful here that we don't preclude. And also, if we do put emergency shelter up there, those folks are already fragile, having been outside for years and or just kicked out of hotels and deserve some semblance of privacy in certain areas. And uh, so... This is a, a delicate matter that needs to be handled uh, as part of a more comprehensive planning process. Okay, thank you. Um, Claire Rock. Thanks Hi, um, 
Yeah, I was just curious. I know that um, as the city of Montpelier, we contribute towards and are a member of the Wrightsville Beach District, and they have a disc golf course. And so I'm just wondering, is this something that is going to be kind of like in competition? And if we're already supporting a disc golf course, is there a way just to kind of, you know, contribute that energy and effort to one that already exists that we're already contributing to? Peter, do you have a thought about that or Arnie? Uh, I, yes, there is a disc golf course at Wrightsville. It's, it's presently in pretty uh, terrible disrepair, at, <laughs> primarily after the flooding in December, where many of the low-lying trees, water, you know, froze up top and the branches all broke off. So um, there, as far as I know, that's not open right now. They're trying to repair it. If it is, it's open on a very limited basis. Um, and it, you know, as we think about as a member of the uh, the Montpelier Commission on Recovery and Resilience, you know, the next flood is is or at least the, you know, the next opportunity for the, the dam to fill up is is right around the corner in some way or another. Um, and so to invest significantly in that property doesn't seem like the best investment for the city. Thanks. Um, so. Are you proposing that you would um, come up with a final design that you would then bring to us so we could we could see what what you were planning to do? I mean, I just worry about sending a bunch of enthusiastic disc golfers out to, you know, create. I think I think it would be my recommendation that we work with city staff mm -hmm. and get approval through city staff. We certainly wouldn't go out and just start building things, but I think. Uh, with your blessing, we could work around. They have keen knowledge of sensitive areas, of areas that are in, in use in other ways, and could uh, work to to oversee that process on your behalf. Uh, just to follow up, do, do you anticipate uh, any tree cutting? Or are you trying to use areas, open areas that exist, or you were saying old logging trails, that sort we're, of thing? We're trying to, we will try to use as many open areas as possible. There may need to be some hazard tree removal or some, you know, a few uh, limited trees, but for the most part, having walked that property plenty, there's a lot of existing open mm -hmm. pathways and to the best of our ability, we will do that. I, you know, I think there will, there likely would need to be some tree removal, but I think it could be done in a way where it got used for the city's uh, firewood program and other things that would be to the benefit of the local community. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Jesse Remy. Thank you. Um, Peter and all involved, I just want to thank you for running with this. And, and it's exciting to think that something uh, like this could happen at the Elks, um, even if at a temporary or a basis where it's going to kind of be modified and be fluid as, as it goes along. Um, I, I've, I'm an avid disc golfer, not as much as Peter. Um, I don't think any of us can keep up with him, but uh, it's pretty exciting. Uh, having Wrightsville this close is, is a really nice thing as well. And as Peter said, disc golf is fairly inexpensive. And I think having a membership and the ability to play different courses uh, as close uh, to our city limits, it would be fantastic. Um, and I, I just, I, I'm excited about it. So I appreciate all the efforts and look forward to volunteering. Thanks. Uh, Joe. Yeah, hi. Thank you so much. Um, I apologize for coming in a little late. Um, I know there are a number of competitive disc golf courses around. There's one in Waterbury Center. I believe there's also one in Berrytown Forest. So I'm just wondering what your projection is as far as, I know you, you were talking about tournaments and stuff like that. Do you see that your proposals can either tie into some of the stuff that's already going on here, or is this going to take away from some of the other um, locations that surround us? Uh, I think that's a great question. I think what, what disc golfers are always looking for is more courses because courses are crowded. Disc golf is the second fastest growing sport in the country. We can't catch pickleball. We've tried, <laughs> uh, but the, the, the growth is tremendous. You see it in the, in the local schools, uh, they do it in gym class and it's growing like crazy uh, just alongside the growth of ultimate and other Frisbee sports. Um, and so the, the need, the demand for additional courses is strong. Uh, I've spoken to uh, several of the, the, the area private course owners as well, who charge a fee and, and bring people on as well as people who use the, the local uh, municipal courses and everybody sees a need for more and doesn't see this as competition. 
And I do have one follow-up question. Now, I apologize for again for coming in late, but I assume you guys are still working on a business plan and a proposal as far as some sort of lease arrangement with the city? We Yes, we would need to work that through for sure. Okay, that's all. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Uh, Adrian. Hi, good evening. Um, thank you for this presentation. Um, I just wanted to say that this is, you know, one of my important um, kind of thoughts around economic drivers in our city. Um, recreation, I think, could be a huge um, asset to our community. And so um, I've worked with Arnie and Alec and Heidi, and I think, um, you know, including this in the all around adventure that we're thinking about for Montpelier and we're really working on collecting data to see how our adventures, both indoor and outdoor, um, contribute to our economy is going to be really important. And so as you go through this process, I'd love, I'm a data person. So when you think about tournaments, um, you know, what type of, um, you know, money does this bring to the city? Um, which, you know, collecting some baseline data and then really building upon that, I think it's going to really be important to us as a city to be the destination in central Vermont for recreation. I think this is um, low risk. I think it could be potentially a huge return for our city as we look at this as one piece of our puzzle for recreation destination for central Vermont. So thank you for bringing this forward and I'm excited about it. Mm -hmm. You have anything to add? Okay. Members of the council, where are we? Are we ready to uh, make a motion of any kind on this? Authority to city staff to work on this. Yeah. Well, and, and I would say, yeah, to authorize them to go forward, assuming they come up with a proposal that is... Uh, meets with the approval of uh, city staff the head of the heads of the relevant departments just do a formal approval of whatever comes up it feels like it's a significant asset and we've got a lot going on around it, it that that's fine with I, me yeah I, yeah it makes total makes total sense yeah but i'm not making a motion of any kind so yeah. just throwing out ideas Terry. Okay, so I uh, will move to authorize city staff to come up with a plan to uh, incorporate disc golf at the Country Club Road site with final approval to be granted by the city council. Cover it. Second. Any uh, further discussion or any discussion? So. Well, we're actually um, asking city staff to work with this group yeah. to design a plan. I think we should specify it. Yeah. Would you accept that as an amendment? Sure. Yeah. That, that's, what you, that's what you said, I think, isn't it? Sure. That's what you meant, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't remember mm -hmm. exactly what I said, but that was definitely the intention. Yeah. Any other discussion? Okay, are we ready to vote on the motion? If so, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. This is an exciting thing. You know, we've been talking for a few years about recreation, outdoor recreation as an economic development driver. And so I'd like to see this happen. Thanks for coming in. All right. We're up to item nine. Uh, parklet fee waiver, second reading. And uh, I will open the public hearing. Bill, do you want to give a 30 second? Yeah. So basically, uh, this is a proposal to amend the park at parklet ordinance to give the council the authority to waive fees uh, under, you know, what you consider to be uh, extraordinary circumstances, or I can't remember the exact wording. Uh, you've already talked about this, signal that it was okay. You've held the first reading, and this is the second reading. And this is, I think, then requested you do a follow-up to actually approve the waivers, even though I think it takes 10 days or something to be effective, but to approve the waivers upon the effective date of the ordinance so that um, people don't have fees to pay this for this year as they recover from the flood. Okay, since it's a public hearing, I'll uh, 
see if there are any members of the public wishing to be heard on this. Uh, Steve? Yeah, Steve Whitaker. Um, I just want to raise a recurring issue in that the use of parklets when the businesses are closed, uh, it should not be exclusive. That This is still public land being temporarily made available. Uh, and some folks have started putting up, you know, chains and arranging furniture to in intentionally block it. But the other thing is that our sweet street sweeping, for instance, was defeated by the parklet in front of Three Penny getting in there before we could get the sand and silt out of there. So all, all that accumulated sand and silt from last summer's flooding was not cleaned up despite the diligent effort of public works in the recent weeks to get get ahead of the sweeping. So who's responsible for getting the sand that gets trapped along these parklets? And I'll again raise the one in the fire lane over along uh, the Haney lot um, that he just takes the no parking sign and moves it out and bolts it on the outside of his deck. And that's not safe if that fire lane and then a truck delivery truck comes and parks further out in the drive. So these parklet, the parklet ordinance needs work and you gave way too much discretion to the city manager and he's made a mess of that too. So uh, those are issues that I think need to be addressed. And the waiver, especially because you're in effect waiving fees, how do we get, can't we use some of that money to uh, potentially clean up around these uh, parklets that's not getting done because of the existence of it in those places? Thank you. Anybody else, any other members of the public? And then I'll go to members of the council. I don't see anyone else in the room who's looking to be recognized. And I do not see anyone else on Zoom who's looking to be recognized. Um, we, we do have members of the council now. Carrie. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm I'm in favor of this. I'm planning to vote for it. I, I do just want to comment, though, that, um, I mean, why I'm in favor of it is because these businesses with parklets suffered during the flood and anything we can do to kind of help them out. But I just do want to make the point that there are other downtown businesses that don't have parklets that also suffered because of the flood who are not getting some kind of a financial break because they don't have parklets. And so we are, the, the businesses that have parklets, one could argue that they're already at a bit of an advantage over others. Like if you've got outdoor seating as a restaurant, you're probably, you're a bit more attractive than a restaurant that doesn't have outdoor seating. And so we're giving an additional benefit to those businesses that already have some competitive advantage over other businesses downtown. So I'm not thrilled with that part of it. I just wanted to make that comment. Thanks. Uh, Palin, then Tim. I just want to add on uh, what Kerry mentioned. Is there any way we can see if these businesses need this? Like, I don't know, sometimes we ask, oh, profit loss, or can they just uh, show us something that they need the support? Or we are just saying that because because of the flood, you just have, have it. Three parklets um, that are in three penny positive pie. And I don't know if uh, Capital Plaza is out yet. So, so there's two. I'm basically saying those two, we just wouldn't charge fees this year. Um, and we, you know, both of them suffered pretty heavy hits in the flood. Um, you know, Councilmember Brown makes a good point. Um, to have a parklet, one has to go through a process of review and approval and actually construct them. And they're, I think I've been told, approximately $10,000 to construct. So some businesses have also made an investment. And, uh, you know, everyone, we're, we used to have a restricted number of spaces and now it's pretty open. So a lot of people have the opportunity to do it if they choose and they may or may not choose. So these are folks that have chosen to make an investment and part of that investment is the fee they pay the city. Tim. It's hard not to ask how many, but you answered that. So blather on to say, I, I do favor this. I think it makes it a dynamic and interesting downtown and the businesses that do do it. And we did see some of their numbers and travails through the, uh, the process where we did appeals uh, this, this last spring. So I think we have a pretty good sense that they all were hit really hard. Um, 
so are others, but I, I do applaud their efforts to create these and, and make Montpelier more vibrant. Thanks, uh, Adrian. Yeah, I just have um, a quick question. One, I love I love them. And I think once our, you know, the vision for Montpelier is to bring in more tourists, to bring in more money. You know, that's one of our, you know, strategic goals um, to have our economics, you know, continue to to increase so that we have a vibrant downtown. I think the parklets add to that. Um, so I am definitely in favor of that. But my question is, and I was just trying to read through the the documents, did they request this or is this something that the city is gifting them? Like, I can't remember the history of how this came about. So I'd be curious. Um, and I'm sorry if we, we talked about this last time, I just forget. So um, if we, I just want to know. The, re the request came to us through Montpelier Live on behalf of the businesses. And we raised it, I think, under... Our, gen, you know, our, our discussion, loose discussion at the end of the meeting to see if there was interest in moving it forward. And then we then warned it for the official hearings. Okay, not seeing any more um, hands raised. I'm going to close the public hearing. And uh, at this point, this is, a, this is our second uh, reading. So at this point, we could, uh, it would be open for a motion to, to adopt the proposal. I'll move approval of the proposal as presented. I'll second. Great, thanks. And is there any uh, further discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 And no opposed. So the proposal is adopted. Now, uh, the question is, we will be having... Uh, in 10 days, this will go in, into effect. Is there a motion to waive the fees for this year? The, the ordinance you just passed uh, allows you to do that, but then you need to take an affirmative action to do it. Yeah. Uh, I, I will move that we waive the parklet fees for the current season. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, thank you. We have done that. Um, whether whether we want to take up, at, at some point in the future, take another look at the ordinance, we can certainly do that. That's not before us tonight. Next up, we have short-term rentals. Um, it's the second reading of the uh, proposal but it, it will only be the second, first public hearing because I think the last time we were here, we had a discussion, but we did not formally open the public hearing. And I think that giving people ample opportunity to come and discuss it is probably a good thing. So I will open the public hearing. Everyone, I'm Rebecca Copians. Hi, I'm Emma Zavez. We are representing the housing, the Montpelier Housing Committee today. Thank you for having us. Um, and we have other members with joining us as well. Um, so we're here to talk about the short-term rental ordinance. And I just wanted to get a read on how, do you want me to read the actual language or do you want me to just give high level? What do you feel that you it's need to, to do? Uh, why, why don't you give us the highlights? Okay. There may be questions. Great. Um, so the Montpelier Housing Committee was created by you to create more long-term housing in Montpelier. Um, if you heard um, any presentation from any of the statewide groups um, in the last couple of years, um, you will know that Every single piece contributes to the to the bigger whole of the housing problem. 
Um, there was a phenomenal uh, presentation by um, the leader of VHFA that said, you know, if you think that um, the housing shortage is caused by a lack of building, you'd be correct. If you think that the lack of housing is caused by short-term rentals, you'd be correct. If you think that housing shortages is caused by zoning, you'd be correct. There are so many different pieces that um, collectively contribute to um, the housing crisis in Montpelier and in Vermont at large. Um, and we, you created this committee to give you um, proposals, um, which is what we are we have done today. This was the first um, kind of salvo. Um, it is not an end all be all <laughs> for our housing problems. We need to build a lot of housing. This is one very small piece of the pie, but it is a piece. And um, so we believe that you need to take action now because we need near term medium term and long term solutions this is a this is an immediate term solution um medium term could be zoning it could be you know other proposals that that the city council may consider may consider and long term is building actually putting houses on the ground but that is a long term project it's not going to happen tomorrow whereas this policy um could be could be in effect much more quickly and you could put housing long term housing on the market in a much more um, expedited way. Um, we want to support people who live here, who volunteer when there's a flood, um, who go to school um, in our elementary and middle and high school, um, and want to live and work here. Um, we want to provide opportunities for year-long, year year-round residents. Um, and we think it's critical that people have an ability to live and afford to live in town. Um, the more you increase the housing supply, um, the lower the rents. There is a direct correlation between um, rental vacancies and the um, the an increase in order affordability. Um, I know I said this before. <laughs> it's been a, a long time since I've been <laughs> talking about this. Surprisingly, um, when Burlington put in their um, their long term their short term rental policy, they were removed from the best place to invest in short-term rentals. It was a, a national publication, Business Insider, that Burlington was a great place to invest in short-term rentals. As soon as they passed the policy, they no longer were a great place to invest because they were focusing on their long-term residents. Um, so just to remind you what a short-term rental is, um, it's a rolling 12-month period. You, If you rent for, um, less than 30 consecutive days or more than 14 days. Um, so what this doesn't impact are legislators, um, traveling nurses. Um, it excludes specifically hotels, motels, inns, um, uh, sober living houses, schools, hospitals, similar, um, similar facilities. I just wanna give you a housing snapshot. Um, this was created by the VHFA, who is a phenomenal resource. They have um, they have put together a really um, interesting, thank you, an interesting mm -hmm. um, snapshot statewide. So you can you can search by communities. Um, these are just a few pieces that I pulled off of um, the Montpelier housing snapshot. Something that really struck me is the percentage of households paying more than fifty percent of their income towards housing expenses. Nine percent of people are paying more than fifty percent of their income. For housing, that is a shocking number, um, and it's it's something that really calls out why this is so critical um, to step forward in every small way that we can. Um, when you look at the median primary home sale price in Vermont, it's pretty high. It's three hundred nine thousand um, dollars as a median. Montpelier is significantly higher than that. Um, the median gross rent is again higher than the Vermont average, um, and this was as of February. Um, and then it gives you the number of households in Vermont that's um, and compared to Montpelier. So household is, you know, someone living in a single dwelling unit um, and homeless individuals um, in, in Vermont. It's 2,780 2, and in the county, Washington County, it's 389. That's a significant number of people that are living on the street because they cannot find housing. Um, the county has a rent rental vacancy rate. So the state is 3.2%. The county is 1.6%. Montpelier is zero, a 0% 0 vacancy rate in Montpelier. 
Um, this is short-term rentals um, over um, since 2014, so about a decade, 20, 2014 to 2024. It is going up considerably. Um, there was about a thousand, a little under a thousand um, a decade ago. It is over 12,000 now. Um, in Washington County, there was, so this is one day in February. And so that's something that's really important to understand about this data. It's until we start gathering the data as a city, we won't know what um, the real impact is. Um, but on one day in February, there was 1,144 short-term rentals in Washington County. There were eight full home short-term rentals in Montpelier. So yeah, on one day. Um, if you go today, um, that, that number could be vastly different. It could be double. It it changes um, depending on, you know, what what the owner has, um, you know, when they put when they put it on for. Difficult. Rebecca, yeah. is that a typo? Is it eight full time full home STRs or eighty eight? It's eighty eight. It's okay. uh, maybe it's cut off. No, it's just you said eight. eight. And oh, it's sorry. Eight, yeah, eighty eight so. 88 full time uh, full home short term rentals. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Um, so just to give a sense of the definitions, um. A host. So we we took um, the uh, the what um, after we came to you the last time the attorney that uh, Mr. Rao I believe yes I don't know how okay. um, attorney for the city planning department who reviewed our ordinance. So he gave us um, recommendations using a very conservative lens, and we integrated those recommendations into uh, this next iteration, this draft. Um, so we, um, now have just to, just to give you a big picture, um, the owner occupied rentals, this does not impact if you are a tenant occupied rental, if it's a, your, your, um, long-term permanent house as a tenant or a, or an owner, um, this policy does not impact you. You can rent your house in the short or long-term, do whatever you want with it. Um, if it's your permanent residence, um, one piece that we, well, I'll just keep going on definitions. Um, sorry. Um, so what we are saying should not be allowed, it, what we feel as the housing committee should not be allowed is taking a house off of the long-term market, this is one of them, um, and renting it out on the short term um, if you don't live there, it's not your full-term residence. Um, with uh, the, the attorney's um, input, we suggested some exceptions. So if it's a seasonal home, um, you know, you generally can't live in it long-term any around the uh, the calendar year. So seasonal homes aren't, are, are accepted. And then the other piece is an affordability criteria that's similar to Burlington, where if you have two units in a Burl in a a on a property and you rent one, um, using an affordability criteria, you can rent a second, one single second unit um, in the short term. It would address a lot of the challenges that a lot of the people that you've heard from um, are concerned with. Um, so if you don't live on site, but you have a house, you have a, a unit that you're renting affordably, then you can rent one, a second unit um, as a short term rental. Um, we would follow also follow Burlington um, that a host may not register more than one um, dwelling unit as a short-term rental. The grandfathering piece, we just heard about this um, last week, which is really surprising to us, um, that you had another uh, attorney um, give an opinion that we didn't hear about. Um, he recommended, um, he, he talked about some grandfather language, following language. Um, yeah, I just... Um... So we became aware of the second legal opinion um, over the last week or so. We have not altered our proposal. Um, our proposal recommends a phase in, um, which is what most communities do, including Burlington, South Burlington. I can look up all the communities in Vermont if you want me to, but I think that's pretty standard um, that nobody is ever grandfathered in forever. Um, and rather there is typically a phase in period. So we have recommended a phase in period. We've kept that in our draft. Um, and if the city council wishes to do something different, they may. Um, but it's our opinion that if we want to move the needle on the availability of long-term housing now, 
then a phase in period makes sense rather than saying that this is the floor <laughs> and only new short-term rentals would be affected. Um, so ultimately that's a decision that's up to city council and their legal teams. Um, but our recommendation is a phase in period over the course of, I'm not sure if we outlined it. Um, yeah, we said, so our, our original <laughs> original date was uh, April 1st because it was based on six months after the first time we spoke with you. <laughs> and naively, we said, oh, they're going to move this right along. Um, so our recommendation would be give it six months or um, start it, uh, you know, January 1, however, but give it some time um, so people can get used to the idea and then have um, another six month period to let people roll through their current um, uh, reservations. Um, so we're not saying, you know, implement tomorrow and just cut the ties. I, I think it's really important to um, to give people time to get used to get used to the idea, understand the law and um, roll through their their current rentals. I just want to also raise that in um, since I heard about the grandfathering, um, I heard about a house that was just bought last week. Um, they are moving. This family is moving to this new house. They're they're short term renting renting their existing home. So it's it's happening all the time. Um, another person, when they heard about the grandfather, they said, "Oh, well, I'm going to immediately rent my." Um, he has a duplex. I'm going to immediately rent my um, uh, my apartments in short term, so it's grandfathered in. You're going to have a rush to the bottom if you create a policy to incentivize that. Um, so we would suggest you have a registration fee that um, that has a um, a list of of data points so you can understand what the um, what the current state is every year. Um, and you can adjust your policy annually if you feel the need. Um, we feel like this, a, a very important piece of this is uh, building standards and, um, and safety. So having, ensuring that people have a fire safety plan, um, ensuring that they have a local emergency contact. There was someone recently that um, their boiler exploded as a renter. What if they didn't have someone to call? <laughs> Imagine the flood that would happen if if they didn't have a number that was readily available of someone that was local. So this says you have to have someone who is local to, to Washington County that's an emergency contact. Um, it also says you have to conform to housing codes. I mean, it's just basic, pretty fundamental basic um, uh, things. Um, enforcement has been a big point of conversation. Um, a volunteer subgroup of, of the housing committee can can check advertisements against the registration number, which needs to be posted, would have to be posted on all um, advertisements. Um, it would be a free way to spot check um, compliance. Um, and then the planning department could mail a, a ticket, just similar to a parking ticket. Um, we, so I already went through the compliance date, uh, the effective date, if you have any questions about that. Um, and that's it. <laughs> that's it. Any questions? Any questions from members of the council? We started to talk about um, the grandfathering and how you just heard about a second opinion. So what's the differential? It was the opinion that we understand the city planning department received a legal assessment of our initial proposal, and that was shared with us. We incorporated all of those comments and feedback. Um, we understand that the council received a separate law firm's confidential legal opinion, which is not shared with us. And so we did not have any ability to think any of those issues through. Um, I am unclear who in the city has seen both opinions and who has not. Etc. So I think those are probably next steps for the council to figure out. Um, but we have done the best of our ability to answer all questions that have been put before us. And just to be clear, we are we are a volunteer committee, and we are not attorneys. <laughs> and I think it's really that's that's why it was really frustrating to get this other information in literally the eleventh hour. You know, two days before we um, were presenting to you. So I think it's. I'm I'm really shocked at how this process is rolled so, out. I can explain that. It's probably my fault. Um, 
we the council asked for an opinion in the fall when this first came up simply about what our authority was what the council's authority was to enact the ordinance so that was this question that was posted so do we need a charter change do we have authority to do it on our own that kind of thing so that was what was asked and that was the primary subject of that opinion in there he did flag grandfathering as something you may have to be careful about it could be that you can't grandfather then went on to say there might be a way to do it if you uh so it was flagged and i don't you know i after that you all took it dave rue worked with you and i honestly didn't you know from from my perspective and i think the council's was okay we can we don't need a charter change to do this that's the question that was asked and answered so i apologize if we didn't share those parts to you it wasn't any intent to withhold anything and i think i think this council member alfano just asked a good question hey we've got this old opinion and what does that mean so we could certainly reconcile those with the two attorneys and figure that out it sounds like if you worked with with dave rue uh he's probably familiar with how burlington did it and i would imagine you know it, it, this is a much more detailed analysis than what we were getting. You know, at first it was sort of here's issues to be considered if you are going to enact one. So I am sorry, nobody was trying to keep you out of it. I do appreciate that. It was certainly, like I said, um, I'll I'll certainly take the blame for that because I, I didn't even share it with the planning staff. It wasn't like they kept it from you. They they asked me about it. I think it was yesterday or today. <laughs> I said, oh, probably probably to disclose that we would take a vote of the uh, since we're the client, we own the. Uh, right. Privilege, it would take a vote of the council to say we authorize disclosing it. Correct. Okay. Uh, Palin. Thank you for the presentation. I think it's getting more detailed and like more to the point. So it is great. Uh, my question will be to you, Bill. Last time uh, we asked uh, what uh, the cost will be to the city to uh have this practice is there any update on that like we asked like uh like a man hour right and the uh, other costs so i believe the planning department's done some work on that josh are you prepared to talk about that from community and economic development specialist for the city i mean we've gotten cost estimates for compliance for some various platforms and those cost estimates are about 10 to fifteen thousand. Um, there's not a lot of um, platforms out there that do host compliance, so we're really restricted. But the two major ones, um, Granicus, and I I'm, can't remember the second one, but those were ten to fifteen thousand dollars based on the number of short-term rentals um, that we have registered that they could identify. So how we will find this money? Where is where is it in the budget? Is that literally the only way that this could be done? I mean, well, I we're think... talking about less, fewer than a hundred short-term rentals. I, I, I don't mean to be, it sounds like an idiot, but a spreadsheet and a list. How complicated could it yeah. be? Well, I think I think the housing committee's um, suggestion is that there would be a group of the housing committee that would sort of be the enforcers to do the research. Um, that is what the city of Winooski eventually ended up doing. They were going to go with Granicus, um, and that was going to cost them about $15,000. And they have very similar, um, a similar number of short-term rentals as we do. And so they decided not to go with that, and they're just going to try to figure it out on their own because of the cost. So uh, does that estimate uh, include the uh, the cost of, of administrating the... Um rental registry that's part of the proposal um no Doesn't. that wouldn't be but i mean so if we're on average like rental registry you're looking at an application right to processing a payment fee around 100 applications a year i, I don't know what that equates to but what does that look like that maybe 30 to 30 minutes 60 minutes of work per application a year Mm. Thanks. Bailing. Um, and also um the proposal has name definitions and like additional information. Will it change the number of the uh houses we are talking about, like 88? There will be like decrease or increase, like whatever the change on the proposal will not 
affect that number. So we will still have 88 units or houses we are talking about, right? So um, the 88 number was one day in, in, in February, 2024. And so every day is a different number. So today it may be 60, tomorrow or next week, it may be 112. I mean, it, it's all, you know, depends on when people are putting their house, their units up for rent. Okay. So it's, it, um, it's not, you know, 88 is not okay. the number, but it's very, it, that's in the current state. Oh, I um, see. And okay. so if we were to um, restrict um, investor owned properties, it would hopefully decrease. Bye. Okay. So is there any data of who, like the number of uh, the people who will register? That's why we need this to get the data. Okay. That's so we will, it yeah. is the next step. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Thank you. Could you do me a favor and uh, stop sharing yes. your screen? Uh, and Adrian, I see you've got your hand up. Yes. Thank you for this presentation. I know that you all have worked really hard on this. Um, and it's complex, right? So, you know, if I wave my magic wand, we would have 300 housing units and bring in, you know, a whole bunch of people into our city. And so that's not going to happen tomorrow. But one of the things that keeps like coming into my brain is, you know, our um, bringing in tourists. And so we have between our hotel, our inn, and our the hotel in Berlin, there's 193 available rooms. And so some people don't like to stay in hotels. Some people like to stay in short-term rentals. So I, I don't know what the balance is of, you know, I know there will still be short-term rentals that will be available through, um, I wish I just saw that slide. I don't have it on my, on the agenda, but there was, you know, the definition of the short-term rentals will still be, you know, in a furnished house or a dwelling. I'm trying to look at the um, the definition, but I think there's a fine balance here of, I don't want to eliminate all short-term rentals because I think it's a way to bring in tourists and, you know, encourage visitors to our city. And so I think I'm just trying to reiterate what, what you're proposing is to limit short-term rentals from investors that are going to buy houses to turn them into solely short-term rentals. I'm just, I want to make sure I'm understanding very clearly what we're trying to do and what problem we're trying to solve by this ordinance um, without having unintended consequences in the future of limiting tourists who um, enjoy, you know, diversified options for, um, you know, staying in a place when they're on vacation. <laughs> um, so this would not eliminate short-term rentals in any right. way. Um, there would still, it would still have, if, if you are, I mean, there's a lot of folks in our community that rent their whole house or their, um, you know, a part of their house um, a, a, quite often. Um, and this also uh, um, makes room for one investor owned property if they have another um, another unit that's, that's affordable. So imagine, um, a duplex, someone has a duplex, they, they live elsewhere. They have a duplex. They can rent one in this, in this ordinance, they would be able to rent one unit if they have, um, if they follow an affordability criteria, um, which I can read if you'd like. Um, and then the second part of the duplex they could rent in the short term. So there is a, there is a path for investor owned, um, properties if they would like to, to choose to follow that path, it's in no way eliminating short-term rentals. There would still be many options for diversified places for people to stay. Thanks. Likewise, if you lived in that duplex and you lived on one side, you could short-term rent the other side, or if you had an ADU on your property. So the terminology that we chose to use is host. Um, and so the host can be the the owner who's the primary resident there, or it could technically be another person who is not the owner, but is that is their primary residence. Um, but it talks about sort of the property. So this, there will definitely still be short-term rentals in Montpelier. It's not going to be the end, but this targets more specifically when Rebecca says investors, she's meaning folks who are buying up multiple houses um, beyond their primary residence um, for profit, essentially. 
like to see if there are other people in the room, since we're still in the public hearing phase, if there are other people here who are interested in uh, being heard on this. Yeah. I live on 25 Hubbard Street in Montpelier. Um, I, there's a lot to unpack here. I, uh, <laughs> I, I came to speak about the housing proposal, but hearing your proposal, I don't know that it solves the housing issue even for the short term. I think that there are some opportunity costs here where you're gonna spend 15 to $20,000 for this kind of thing and create a bureaucracy, that I, another bureaucracy that we don't need. But uh, having said all that, you know, having list, those are my responses to your, to your uh, proposal. Uh, here's what I was gonna say. <laughs> Do we need more housing? Great question. How can we create more housing? Another great question. Build a new bureaucracy to register, regulate, and tax short -term, term rentals? I think that's the wrong answer. Um, we are much more interested in a city vision and effort to support housing development. What happened to the proposal and uh, uh, cottage development up near um, Upper College Street? What happened to the existing development possibility down at Hubert Road? What other things are in the pipeline. We just heard from Sandy Fitzhume, who was a former student of mine, by the way, make a great proposal uh, for the Elks Club. We also, in, in, also in, are eager to hear more innovative ideas for more feet on the street. Instead of taxing and regulating short-term rentals, what about incentivizing locals to create spaces for tourists and visitors who will, be, uh, who will bring business to the downtown? We locals care a lot about the health of our downtown. I don't want to see this place die. And we can't do it all. We want visitors who need short-term rentals to enjoy what Malpeter has to offer. These rentals are not the problem. The lack of housing is the problem. Thank you. Thank you. Steve. Steve Whitaker. Um, I think that it we understand that de developing new housing takes years. It takes years in the planning, the investment, the land acquisition, the permitting, even finding a contractor to build a house is right now sometimes a two year or more wait. Uh, we have seen the speculation of short term rentals being bought up by folks and corporations, LLCs, et cetera, to grab markets off the grab properties off the rental market that would normally be available to Montpelier at affordable to Montpelier because they can make three, four, 10 times the money using it as short-term rentals. We can't afford to have a, that much erosion, further erosion of our available housing stock for rentals. Much of it needs to still be rehabbed and, the speculation, the rampant speculation that's displacing Montpelierites cannot be allowed to continue. So the ordinance is necessary. Uh, the grandfathering is a, is a bad idea uh, because it will create a real rush to get everybody positioned too quick. I would suggest you implement it now or implement it the grace period and it's take effect, you know, January 1 of 25 or something like that. I wouldn't string this out. Um, the register, this is not a bureaucracy to manage. It, you know, to keep track of how many there are and are they properly advertising the registration number in their ads, or are they cheating the system? It sounds to me it's gonna be about a hundred dollar annual fee per unit, uh, is what I'm my quick back of the envelope math. So I I support you moving forward with it. Um it seems well thought out and well researched. Thank you. Um, anybody, any other members of the public who want to be heard either? Oh, Thank you. please. Uh, Lisa Edson Neva, and I'm here supporting what George was saying a minute ago. Um, I have real concerns about this legislation or these rules. It's really an attack on our middle class. Because how many units do I have to own before I'm allowed to earn more money? So if you have an inn or you have the hotel, we all know that short-term rentals bring in a lot more money. 
How many units does someone have to own before they're allowed to bring in more money? The reason you're seeing so many of these units switch over to short-term housing is because people who live here can't afford to live here and are choosing that. Or people who live here are looking at it as a business opportunity. They have one unit, and then as they get to a point that they can purchase another unit, that they do. And I know that there are probably some of you here, because a lot of you know that I'm here for another topic on this, on the agenda as well, but I came here for this one as well. For me, as I'm looking at carrying two mortgages, I need to add a second rental unit to my, my current home. So I'm looking at having two units. Realistically, there's a huge amount more money for me if I rent that short term. So I agree with some of the other things that are saying we're saying here. We should be incentivizing having homeowners rent long term rather than punishing them. Why are we punishing people that have two or three units and not allowing them to earn that same level of income that the hotels and the inns are allowed to earn? Those of us with Airbnbs or something like that, we're already paying the same taxes as the hotels are paying. We're already paying the same city taxes. Why are we being charged more because we only have one or two rooms to rent? Now we're talking about 88 total units. And I recognize that depending on the day, that may be more or less, but we're talking about a very small number. And as they've said, in the majority of those situations, it's households that are only renting one unit. This isn't gonna impact that. So adding all of this bureaucracy and these costs to gain how many units and at what cost to keep those families from being able to advance, I'm just disappointed that this is the direction that we're thinking about heading rather than just looking at ways to increase the amount of housing units available. Thanks. Thank you. Um, uh, Stan Brinkerhoff. Hi, Stan Brinkerhoff uh, from Montpelier. I, I'm a member of the housing committee, but I, I speak for myself tonight. Um, I think, you know, Adrian, you raised an interesting point earlier, and I, I should have written it down. Um, but there's an interesting dynamic with interest rates where people are leaving their current houses and they can rent them out on Airbnb for more than the mortgage, right? With a with a 2.9 or a 2.7% APR, you can, at this point, move into a new house. It could be more expensive. It could be a cheaper house. And it's it is taking housing stock away from from Montpelier for the long term. Um, I had addressed this council group with an email early on with concerns. Um, I think that this group has done an immense amount of work, uh, Rebecca and, and Emma and others, to try and f uh, place this where it needs to be, which I, I think is to protect those who who are, you know, as, as the previous speaker said using this for, for income. That's the vast majority of the folks in my player. This is, is a answer to income or allowing them to travel. Um, but we are seeing, we absolutely are seeing and other communities in Vermont are seeing uh, you know, the purchase. And I won't use the word investor, right? But uh, purchasing another house and financing them both with an Airbnb or um, taking rental units off the market. I, I posted to, to front porch form earlier today at a, a mailman in the community said he has to move out of town because he he can't afford his rent. It's being converted to an Airbnb. A teacher reached out. You know, our community is being impacted by this. And you know, I'm the one that Rebecca mentioned earlier saying I would probably put my units up to get around the grandfathering, right? I, I see the I see both sides of it. I I, I do. Um and I I think this is something that if we do, we we need to be careful of and if Montpelier returns to a normal environment where there are 5% free rentals, the free market is, is, is back in effect and we can talk about Airbnbs. But with 0% rentals, Airbnbs are, are absolutely contributing to the increase in rent prices. Um, they're taking units off the market. And, and I don't think it's in, in the room. I don't think it's a harmful thing in all cases, but or intentionally harmful. Um, but when there is no stock in Vermont, and we're seeing people leave the community because they can't work here. I think measures need to be in place uh, as long as I, 
you know, Stand is happening. Thank you. Thanks, Stan. Helen. So I just want to um, double check one information. Uh, I think we, I think um, Councillor Hurl mentioned that state is planning to do the this registration mandatory or something, right? Does anyone remember that? Okay, so I just want to check if um, that information is accurate or... There have been okay. legislative proposals. I don't know if anything has been uh, adopted in the current uh, or just ended legislative okay. session. It's not like a um, certain or the state future plans. It's just a, like a ideas or brainstorming at the state. That that's what, that's okay. what I think. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Sal, were you going to say? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I'm basically in, in favor of this type of ordinance, but I think um, in in the legal opinions that I've read, and I've read them both, there, there are two important points. One is the rolling 12-year, 12 12-month 12 period. The, the Vermont statute that applies according to the, this, is, I'm, I'm not an attorney either, I read the opinion. The Vermont statute uses calendar year. And so the attorney was saying we should really conform to that. Otherwise it could it could be it could be challenged. The other one is the grandfathering part. And it seems pretty black and white to me. I mean, what what he's saying is you you can't pass an ordinance retroactively. If something is non-conforming, which which air, existing Air and Bs would be if this ordinance was passed, they don't have to comply unless something changes, some part of the use changes. And I think, based on the advice in this opinion, that if we're going to go forward with this ordinance, we have to we have to manage that. We have to allow for that. One idea was to change the minimum period from one year to six months. We can also um, create terms that um, further define what it means to expand or extend, that sort of thing. But I don't think we can simply say, as of this date, it's mandatory. I think it'll be challenged. And in fact, I've been reading that there are host groups now that are banding together to, to challenge this kind of stuff. So um, there's also the cost of the challenge, but I think we need to we need to cover all the all the bases. And we have we have a couple of attorneys telling us things that we need to look out for. And I think the grandfathering is is pretty clear in the Vermont statute. I don't think that the first attorney, the opinion that was shared with us, addressed grandfathering, which Not is at all. interesting. Um, so I do think that that the city needs to reconcile the legal opinions that they've received and also probably share that information with the city's planning department since the, they're the experts on what the zoning ordinances are, because that second legal, the other legal opinion that, that does address it talked about the specifics of how Montpelier did its charter and zoning um, compared to the state definitions. And so... So I think it makes sense that that the council may want to advise city staff to to take some of those next steps to see what the consensus legal recommendation is so that Montpelier can move forward. Mm -hmm. Clearly, other communities like Burlington and have these phase in periods. So it's clearly possible. But yes, absolutely. The city needs to to follow the recommendations to make sure they can do that in a in a comprehensive. So you're saying that the ordinance that you or you modeled some of the other, or you reviewed some of the other ordinances, they they essentially have created a retroactive ordinance. Or they have a phase in period. So but it's like still early, retroactive. Uh, if you're if you're if you're non-conforming, if you have an an, uh, an STR now, yep. You, you have, have to comply. Months. I think that Burlington was months. nine months. So you have to register up by a certain date, and then you have an additional, I think Burlington was like nine months or so, mm -hmm. to fulfill all reservations, and then it, it needs to stop. 
Um, well, you know, attorneys like to argue with each other, so maybe they do. And Burlington's charter may be different than ours. Yeah. Their zoning may be different than ours, et cetera. But I think South Burlington also has a phase in period. And my sense from us surveying is that many communities. I was very surprised by the idea of grandfathering all, just with and and I haven't gone through every yeah. single yeah. single well, one of the community, that. but sure. But I think that yes, it would be a good idea to 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 reconcile the legal opinions and understand what are the next steps um, to to support ensuring yeah. that we move forward with a good plan. Yeah, after Adrian, Adrian has your hand up. Uh, Adrian, uh, can I done just continue? Oh yeah, yes. Um, so I, I I agree. We we ought to take that. the the uh, The other part of it is the. Um, rental registry and and the registry that you're talking about applies only to strs um i think it's a good idea for the city to have a, a rental registry of all rentals i mean we we already have a lot of the information we 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 you know do an assessment of properties and so on but i think we need to know where where the rental properties are how many people are there how often it changes i mean there's just safety and public health issues um but i would also like to know what it's going to cost. I mean, Josh was talking about platforms to do this, but um, I, I don't know what the platforms do. I I believe the platform he's talking about is essentially what we would do as a volunteer committee for no cost, which is you look at the ad, you look you look at Airbnb, which, you, which you have to do you. every day because you don't have to do. It well, it depends on you know the last time we had talked. Um, there were a couple of counselors that that said you know. This doesn't have to be a day by day. It could be, you know, there's six well, but what, they what all make I, one month. And what I'm getting that is if you have a registry, yeah, you're done, right? You know where they are. Well, if you so, require it. it well, the, the the enforcement is that you have the registry that you yeah. check against. Well, you have a you have a check against, yeah. sure. But I and think it's pretty the, simple. The 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 cost in uh, dollars and cents and effort is in establishing maintaining the, the registry and i th i would like to have a better idea of what that cost would be before i said let's go ahead with i mean in addition to changes in language before i said let's go ahead with the ordinance which i favor but with those sort of caveats thanks adrian then tim so as i just sit here just listening to all this you know, back and forth about the ordinance and bureaucracy and policies. Like, I would definitely regret not saying this, but I think, you know, the housing committee, um, you know, when I did talk to Rebecca about this in terms of, you know, the um, the direction that the council, I, don't, I wasn't here on the council when, when they were, you know, starting this process of a short-term rental ordinance, but we're in a crisis and we need housing. And so... I would love the housing committee to focus on creative ways to bring in housing rather than, you know, having ordinances, having bureaucracy, having more, you know, paperwork and registries. Um, you know, I think this is a good idea because I, I also don't want a whole bunch of investors coming into Montpelier to buy our houses and have rentals. Like, I think that is the problem that you're trying to head off. But I think as the housing committee, and I, I would love to be, you know, corrected if I'm wrong, but the housing committee, you know, I, I think is there to help, you know, encourage housing in Montpelier. And, you know, we do have land, but I think there are creative out of the box ways to increase our housing in Montpelier. And I think that's what needs to be the focus uh, moving forward. Um, for that committee instead of, you know, continuing to focus on different policies that we then have to manage um, in the city and and add to our bureaucratic processes. So um, that is just what I'm sitting here thinking about, like scratching my head. Um, is this what we need to focus on right now? Um, is this a priority for the city um, when we do have various, um, very serious other topics that we must focus on to um, you know, our, you know, housing, our homeless, our, our roads, um, you know, is this our top priority? And I'm very concerned that we're spending a lot of time on this when we have other issues to discuss. Thanks, Adrian. Tim. Yeah. Um, I've been struggling with this 
Gordon since I first became a city council member on the housing committee and been listening. And my approach when I started was like, what Adrian just said is I don't, I just didn't see the need for it. But the more I've listened, I realized it's an issue that's building. Um, I think Stephen Whitaker's wrong. I don't think investors are flocking to Montpelier to purchase properties right now to turn them into short-term rentals. I mean, I do this every day. There's only a hundred sales a year, roughly. It's easy to dissect them and go through what's happening. And that's not a big trend. There, admittedly, there are more, it seems like anecdotally, there are more short-term rentals happening. Um, so I'm not saying it's not. Uh, the key is, if it becomes an issue, or not like Stowe, is, is how to deal with it. I know a few people I've talked to, and I've kind of gone out to talk with folks that I know have short-term rentals and get a sense of what'll happen if this ordinance is passed. I think at best, this ordinance may bring a few units back onto the long-term stock. I think a lot of the folks that run them currently as short-term rentals will go to a different model, but they won't necessarily become long-term rentals. They may become visiting nurses or something that's you know a three-month stint instead of the 30-day number that's in, that we've chosen for the ordinance. Uh, and I'm not sure that changes the flavor of it a lot um, in terms of what you're trying to achieve. Um, I think Sal mentioned the rolling 12-month period piece, which I agree. I think just even for management, it needs to be a set time, you know, a set calendar year. Um, it feels like the regular, the real-life reg vacancy rate in my flavor is not zero. Um, I've got four of these right now and a couple more that I've got noticed coming up. So I think there is still a turnover that's happening. And uh, so to say, it's it's low, but it's not zero. Um, I am concerned about the staff time and the cost to administer the ordinance is written. It's it's kind of controlling, and there's a lot of levels of it. So when you get into even adding the affordability factor, then you're going to have to know people's income and numbers. Um, it just adds another whole layer to it um, that maybe at least for a first time out, maybe a little too much. And for the volunteer enforcement piece, I've never liked that since it was mentioned. And then hearing you tonight respond to the attorney's thing saying, but we're all volunteers here. Uh, you know, we don't do anything that we have to enforce legally in Montpelier with volunteers. It's just, it's not the way we've handled anything else. And, and I'm not sure when it's as important as people's housing, their investments, the size of what you're dealing with in their lives, to think that you as a volunteer can go in and start telling them what to do. Um, it's not going to work. <laughs> You'll find there's passion there that's probably equal to yours for why there shouldn't be short-term rentals. And um, I guess that's it. Yeah, I'm just okay. I'm really concerned that I, I guess I do favor the rental registry part at this point. So I think it's a positive. I, I think that we can quantify the issue if we start a rental registry within a year. We'll have a sense of what we're really dealing with, and and then maybe can build this policy to fit. Rebecca, um, I just want to respond to two things. I'm not saying volunteers are going to go knock on someone's door. Yeah. I'm saying they can do the legwork and the planning department or their designees. It could be the police officer department. It could be um, Mr. Frazier's office. They, There is a city department that is ultimately responsible for it. All I'm saying is you don't have to hire a 25, you know, a, a 10 to $20,000 vendor to do a very small job. Um, the affordability criteria is based on median income in the um, uh Area median income. The area median income. It's not. It's not asking someone for their income. It's saying here is. It has to be under X, which is based on a, a broader criteria. It's not individual. But then you just have to go out and verify if they're going by that, right? So you have to get the income and know. Well, you get no. You just get the, the rental amount. The rent. The lease. You get the lease amount. And so when they submit their. Who gets know, the lease? If you so this is if someone has two say a duplex, yeah. they're renting one in the short term, yeah. one in the long term. They would say you have to, you have to the the affordability criteria has to be met for the long term rental in order to rent the other property in the the other unit in the short term. So what that would mean is that's even worse than I thought. I'm sorry. Yeah. Sorry, uh, HUD publishes um, a median income for our area, and so I understand they'll that. say like you know a one bedroom unit needs to be less than twelve hundred something something. So it's not. Um, it's not the it's not the individuals yeah, it's the amount of rent yeah rent. how much is the property being rented for and i will say this we added in response to community concerns um this is something that we did not originally envision um it seemed like a nice thing to do that burlington does as a way to encourage you know give more leniency for folks who have existing short-term rentals um i think the council has heard from one or two people who this would benefit 
um, if it's not a proposal that the council is interested in, it wasn't part of our initial package anyway. Okay. Um, I'm not seeing other people in the room who haven't, haven't spoken before. I'm not seeing people in the um, online who haven't spoken before or seeking to be recognized. At this point, I'm going to close the public hearing so then we can discuss where to go from here. Um, uh, and we've got, uh, this is technically only the first public hearing of this ordinance. So in order to proceed, we would need a motion to, uh, to schedule this for a second public hearing. And, uh, you know, my thinking about this is that uh, I moved here to Montpelier in 1983, and it was just after there was a wave of uh, conversions of housing to offices. And if, for instance, if you look along Court Street, there's all those properties that are lawyers and lobbyists and whatever that all, all used to be housing and used to provide housing for people. And, uh, and the city didn't act to, uh, to prevent that. And as a consequence, that, that housing uh, was lost, that people could be living in now if they... Uh, if we uh, take an action at this point, it's not going to, this isn't the one solution. As Rebecca said, you know, we're not, uh, you can't say that there's only one thing that's causing uh, housing uh, prices to go up, but, and, and it's probably not even going to create new housing at this point, but if it, but if this can uh, slow down the loss of, uh, long-term rental units that that's essentially what we're trying to do here that's that's the proposal and and so the, the so the question is there a motion to uh, set this for a second public hearing or is that what you're going to say Carrie you're going to do something else okay uh so I I'm very much in favor of this um and I've put a lot of thought into this as part of the housing committee, had lots of conversations with people in the public, really, you know, kind of gone back and forth a lot. But um, but I'm very much in favor of this. And I think that this I, we're not going to create a whole bunch of new housing, but we can head off something that is starting to happen, which is the loss of long term permanent housing to the short term rental market. So I grew up on Martha's Vineyard, which is a tourist place. And short-term rentals, most of the of the houses on Martha's Vineyard are short-term rentals or they're summer homes that people just live in for, you know, a couple weeks out of the year and they sit empty the rest of the time. The If you think housing is bad here, it is it is unbelievable. I mean, they, they don't have teachers, they, they don't have doctors, they don't have, you know, just people to work in the post office, they don't have people to run the ferries so that people can go back and forth on the island because people just can't afford to live there. There's just no housing available. And it really is largely because they've been lost to short-term rentals. Now it's a totally different economy there. It's 100% based on tourism, which is different from Montpelier, but that's an extreme of what can happen. And it really destroys a community. And I, I look at the, at the Airbnbs and just casually looking at them online in Montpelier, they really look like their rooms in people's houses, their uh, ADUs, you know, that's what's happening in Montpelier right now. But I think that we're starting to see that change. And that's what I'm worried about. Um, there, there is a building in my neighborhood, an apartment building that recently changed ownership. And I don't know what's happening in there for sure. But a lot of people who've moved out because the rents have gone up dramatically and have con continued to go up. They didn't just initially go up. They keep going up. People who've lived there for years are moving out and they're, and they're telling us, their neighbors, we're moving out because they just keep jacking up the rent and it feels like they're trying to make us leave. And every day I see someone from the property management company with their official car pull up to the house, get out with a vacuum cleaner and mop and broom and go in and clean something and come out. They're not cleaning apartments that families are living in. You know, so I, I don't know if it's, I don't know what's happening there, but it certainly could be that that is turning into short-term rentals. And that's the kind of thing that I would like to stop if we possibly can. 
whether or not that's actually the case there. Now, the whole issue about people who are currently doing it, I think that is something we need to we need to sort out. Um, and the the opinion that we read recently had some suggestions about changes to our zoning that we might be able to use to kind of work this. But I but I do think that's something we have to we have to figure out. And I don't think that the ordinance as it's currently written is probably um, I mean, it probably doesn't fly quite the way it is. So we got to tend to that. Um, as far as the cost and the additional administrative burden, I, I think as part as we got to take it on. We got to do it as part of what we have to do, because this is this will have a devastating effect on the community if it's allowed to continue without any kind of check. So, thanks, Gary. Yeah. Oh, I wanted to answer Adrian. You asked a question about well, what is going on? Why is the housing committee? Uh, doing this, and I was on the housing committee when uh, when we first created it, and uh, Rebecca was chair. And what she laid I'm out, you know, <laughs> but well, but what, when you got onto the to the committee, one of the first things you, you said was that you would like us to start out by having doing the things that are manageable and achievable in the short term, knowing that housing development and a lot of other stuff is going to uh, be a longer term proje project. And so I think this really is going back to one of the things the you know, committee started at the very beginning, which is that let's look at this short term thing that we can address while all the other things uh, are also being done. Yeah, Tim. Follow that thought, Jack, because I just my first year or so participating and things change. And I think we need to be flexible with that. And I think maybe that was a direction, but as we look at what's coming out of it right now and the magnitude of the crisis in this community needing housing, um, this committee has worked so hard and people have put incredible efforts into this policy and also the housing trust fund piece we're going to hear about in a few minutes. I mean, the effort and the work is incredible and it's all well-meaning, but neither of these projects are really going to create any new housing. And so I do think because the housing committee advised the city council at the workforce, I think it would be uh, in everyone's best interest at this point to ask for a focus on uh, the committee's efforts to create more new housing. Okay. So there we are. We've we've closed the uh, public hearing. The next question is, is there a motion to schedule this for another uh, public hearing? What would be a reasonable time frame if, in fact, you went ahead and we resolved the legal issue and wanted to incorporate the language, how long would that take? Question. I, I, we are not attorneys, and this is at a point of, we are a volunteer committee. And the quicker oh, we'll you relieve tomorrow. us of this, we'll the quicker we can do other things. We'll touch tomorrow, meet with people tomorrow, see how quickly we can, you know, turn that around. I mean, probably not our next meeting. Yeah, that's what I was it's thinking. If we did the one after, that's July 17, I would imagine we could have, certainly have clarity on that by then, um, even if they're taking some time off or whatever. I would think that that would be, this isn't completely, you know, this isn't Supreme Court law here. This is to be something we could figure out. So so that's a, that's a big piece. And then I can think a little bit more about, you know, how we would implement this. Uh, in that case, I will move that we schedule the next hearing for the June 17 July uh, July 17 council meeting thank you okay second any uh we we've had a bit good bit of discussion already any any discussion on this motion if not all those in favor signify by saying aye aye aye, aye. any opposed okay thank you we're done with that and um, I, I think that the, uh, next item is likely to take more than the seven minutes until eight 30. So I'm going to say, let's take our 10 minute break now, and then we'll come back at eight 33 to take up the housing trust fund guidelines. It's working. Yes. Well done. Yeah. Um, well, introduce ourselves. So, um, my name is Emma Zavis. I live in Montpelier. I'm a member of the housing committee. Um, Yep. Sean Shan, also Montpelier resident and member of the Housing Committee. Diane Sherman, former member of the Housing Committee and former Montpelier resident. 
Awesome. All right. Uh, well, we are here tonight to talk a with you a little bit about the Montpelier Housing Trust Fund. And there we go. <laughs> um, so we're going to start out by talking uh, uh, to you a little bit about the history of the Montpelier Housing Trust Fund. Then we'll get into our recommendations for revising the Housing Trust Fund. Um, talk about major initiatives, uh, annual workflow timeline, roles and responsibilities, and then we'll we'll talk about discussion and questions. And I apologize for the numbering; did not do well moving from Google Slides to PowerPoint. <laughs> the numbers are all wrong. Um, all right, so let's begin. So the Montpelier Housing Trust Fund was established in 2005. Um, there is an annual allocation as part of the fiscal year budget process. Those of you who are on city council during the budget setting time probably remember that. Um, originally uh, in 2005, it was passed as one cent for housing, which meant one cent on the grand list. Um, since then it's evolved into this sort of year yearly annual allocation process, um, which sometimes has tracked around the grand list um, and sometimes has gone up and down. Um, you'll see in the table, I included the last five or six years, um, the allocation amounts. Um, some of the original goals of the Housing Trust Fund were to increase the number of affordable dwelling units, um, attract and retain young families, and also to ensure adequate supply of workforce housing. Um, so historically, there have been two initiatives, main initiatives uh, for the Housing Trust Fund. The first is uh, grants for large affordable housing project uh, developments. And um, those amounts have been between 50,000 and 175,000. The way it has sort of worked out in practice is that the city typically gives a grant every two to three years um, to a project. Um, it's one of obviously many, many funding sources <laughs> um, that all go into making a project happen. So. Um, I just listed the last three uh, projects that the city has supported from the trust fund and the amounts um, that we supported it with. Um, the other, um, so that that was really focused on sort of development of housing. The other initiative is the first time home buyer loans. Um, so that's focused more on an individual subsidy um, affordability program. Um, that is a 0% loan. Um, it's due uh, if the, the, Home buyer eventually sells their home. So um, we've had some of those repaid, you know, in recent years and other people will live in their homes forever. <laughs> so we may or may not see them repaid in the near future. Um, I think most recently those loans have been in the amount, the ballpark of $10,000. Um, and I've just put some stats up there for just the last few years, how many loans we've given um, for that program. So changes. <laughs> um, so Diane, Sean, and I have spent the last year and a half doing a deep dive into the housing trust fund. We have uh, asked for and read every document we could possibly get our hands on. Um, we have talked to the planning department. We've talked to multiple nonprofit housing groups, um, agencies. We have talked to the full housing committee, and we've done our own research on initi initiatives. Um, and so we are uh, proposing some changes. Uh, we would propose to clarify the purpose of the fund um, to be to construct and rehabilitate affordable housing units in Montpelier for ownership or rental, and to make existing housing units more affordable to buyers. Uh, we are recommending that the City Council allocate $250,000 annually to the Housing Trust Fund. The guidelines as they are revised are written as such that you can you can always allocate more, but you can also allocate less <laughs> in any given year and you don't have to update the guidelines to do that. You can, it's at your discretion each year, but our recommendation is 250,000. Um, we are recommending that uh, the Housing Trust Fund support three different initiatives. The first is continuing the major affordable housing project grants we think that that's a really important part of developing new affordable housing um, in the community um, and should sort of be the top tier priority. Um, Diane will talk a little bit more about that in a moment. And um, we are recommending that we end the first time home buyer loan program. We are not really sure, nor is anyone else, how much that program is really moving the needle now that housing prices are so high. Um, 
10,000 is like barely covering closing costs at this point. Um, so after much research, um, we are recommending that when there is um, more money after, after doing a large grant for the affordable housing projects, that if there is additional money in the fund that that go towards um, the support of two existing local programs um, that are already doing great work in our communities um, and really leveraging that great work and doing more of it. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit more about each of those programs um, in a moment. And I'm gonna pass it over to Diane to talk about a few things. So the other changes we made holistically were principally to help with clarity and to really flesh out some of the requirements. Um, so in particular, you know, we we had a when we went through the current guidelines, they hadn't been looked at since 2018. So they've been in place for a long time. And we wanted to add more clarity in terms of what are the actual criteria for each project? What are the documents that have to be completed? We added require we added clarity around application and review processes, which will help both applicants and people who are reviewing it because they'll have a sense of applicants will have a sense, is my project going to be eligible? And reviewers will have an easier time knowing what they're actually supposed to be considering when they look at applications, which is something we really struggled with having gotten an application, which never we never got a complete application, but we got a preliminary application, not knowing like what criteria we're supposed to apply. Um, we also added a clear identification of the responsibilities for the housing committee, the planning department, and others. And we created accountability for all the parties involved, um, including you know making sure that the people who receive the funds will be providing reports to us, making sure that the funding partners, principally it's going to be downstreet for the two programs I um, talked about that are supplemental to the affordable housing project grants, um, you know, establishing con concrete contracts with them and making sure we have formal grant and loan agreements. Um, we have some, you know, the city has some examples from past projects of those and tracking the HGF use and reporting that to city council on an annual regular basis. Um, so that was one of the things we wanted to do. And then I'll talk a little bit about the first two programs. So you've heard that the affordable housing project grants is a longstanding program. So here we really did add focus on adding clarity. Um, it actually did take a lot of our time because understanding the definition of affordable housing took and was incredibly, was more hard than we ever suspected it would be. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we did overall, so just give you a quick idea of the, of the project or the program here. We are um, indicating in the guidelines that you should reserve $150,000 every year toward these, toward these projects, like Emma said, focusing on the, the money going to creation of new housing units or the rehabilitation of housing units that are off market, basically. Um, and this would mean that if, City Council allocates $150,000 only in a year, and that's how much the fund has, that can only go to affordable housing project grants. If you allocate more and the fund ends up having more that fiscal year, it can go to the other projects. And also, if it if if you allocate more than 150, it could still go to more of these affordable housing project grants if you got good applications and you wanted to fund those. Um, but generally speaking, you know these are probably going to be larger grants. But we we provided flexibility in these guidelines so you don't have to keep revising them. You are able to revise these at any point because these are not an ordinance. But we still wanted to add clarity and you know try to make it so you don't have to do a lot of work every time you look at these or every time you might want to change the program up a bit. So the range of funding would be $25,000 to $150,000 per project. Um, eligible applicants would be public housing authorities or nonprofit development organizations. Those are the entities that are really developing these kinds of projects. Um, the housing committee considered adding private developers, but we ultimately decided that doing so would just create such an impossible burden for the city and for the housing committee that at this point it didn't make sense because public housing authorities and nonprofits are the ones who are receiving similar funds from other sources already subject to all of these requirements. And so the city review of these is leveraged by the fact that that's already happening in other ways. So it just re it reduces the workload and the administrative burden. Um, so in general, you know, this would again be for the construction of new or rehabilitation of existing housing units that will be affordable for ownership and rental, 
the definition of ownership and rental on an affordable basis is, is in the guidelines. Generally speaking, affordability is usually tied to 30% of your income. Whatever your income is, that's affordable. But in the guidelines, it establishes that that sale price, that rental price is based on, um, for the sale price, it's based on whatever is affordable to someone who's at 80% of the county median income. Um, and then there's an affordability covenant that that created or rehabilitated unit be affordable for a minimum of 15 years. So that's a snapshot of that program. And then going on to the ADU program, um, some of you may be familiar with the VHIP program that's available out there currently that's been available for at least a year, maybe two, um, for people in across the state who want to develop ADUs. So as I mentioned before, you know, we this this program would only be available if there's extra money in the fund beyond $150,000 that fiscal year. Downstreet is the entity that administers VHIP in our area. And so to sort of leverage the program that's already there, we wanted to take advantage of basically everything that exists in VHIP with the most, with the smallest amount of tweaks possible that we thought um, would be positive. And so the one change we made was that VHIP currently offers a five year, it's a it's a grant for it's a grant, and then you have a five year affordability requirement where you have to rent the unit at HUD fair market value, which is its own defined term. Um, or you can get a 10 year forgivable loan and you have to maintain affordability for 10 years. The city, we talked to the planning department and Josh, you know, can certainly speak up and correct us if we get this wrong, but um, the housing committee and the planning department, I believe, were interested in doing this as a zero interest loan that's due upon sale so that it does have some opportunity to have money flow back in to the fund. Um, the eligibility criteria would be basically all the same that's already currently in VHIP and Downstreet would do most of the work. We have to create some of the documents, but, um, you know, most of the work would be at, at, you know, done through downstreet and working with them. <laughs> Thanks. All right, um, and I'll just share. So the third initiative program is uh, leveraging another downstreet program that's already doing great work in our community. That's the shared equity down payment assistance grants. Um, so, and funding of course, for this program would be contingent on there being more than the $150,000 in the fund. So after those uh, large affordable housing grant programs. Um, so uh, if there was funding left over um, in the housing trust fund um, and there was an eligible applicant uh, to Downstreet for this program and Downstreet had run out of the regional state funding that they're given every year, um, then at that time uh, we could fund an additional shared equity uh, home in Montpelier. Um, and those amounts are 20 to 80,000 per project. I think most recently 60 to 80,000. And I'll use the next slide to describe what exactly is this program. <laughs> um, so this program essentially eliminates or greatly reduces the need to have a down payment um, to purchase a home. So it essentially gives a uh, grant for that 60 to 80,000 to bring down um, the cost of the home to cover that down payment area for an individual. Um, there is um, an income eligibility criteria. You have to, uh, your household income needs to be 120% of the HUD median area income or less. Um, you apply through Downstreet. I believe Downstreet's currently receiving funding for two from the Vermont Housing Finance Agency per year in its region. We are just one town of many in the region. Um, and so they run out of funding very quickly <laughs> uh, for this program. And so if they did run out of program uh, program funding for the region and there was an individual interested in Montpelier, they could potentially go through this um, to get the funding to do a home here. Um, the way that it works is the home goes into the downstreet portfolio. Um, so an individual could purchase the home with this shared equity uh, grant, they could live in it forever. That would be totally fine. Um, they could also sell it if they want to. And if they sell it, um, the sale goes back through downstreet to the next income eligible family. Um, the appreciation on the house, 25% will go to the seller. The other 75% um, goes into 
uh, replenishing sort of the administration of the program for downstreet, and then the rest gets plowed into further grants for this property. So the grant amount over time is growing. Um, so the price of the house is not static. It's not getting frozen at the time it comes into the program, but it is always consistently much more affordable than it would be on the regular market. Um, so it's a really effective program. It's a national model that was actually, I think, pioneered by the Champlain Housing Trust. And they did a large report on it there. And I think the average tenure for living in a house was about seven and a half years across the, the spectrum of their houses. So it's a really nice affordability opportunity that recycles to more and more families and helps them build equity and then go on and, and purchase a home on their own and frees up the opportunity for more people in the community. Um, so with that, oh, I'll do one more slide. <laughs> then I'll turn it over to Sean. Um, just, I think we've already outlined this, but just to say it again, um, recommending that the first 150,000 be reserved each year for those large affordable housing project grants. That's probably your biggest hitter where you're going to develop the most units. Um, and after that, funding these additional opportunities for additional housing construction through ADUs and affordability subsidy programs for folks who wanna live here in Montpelier. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to Sean. Thanks. And then on the, the annual timeline, I'm not gonna read all these bullets here. You can, can look at them, but I think the high level points are we tried to try to lay out the annual cycle in line with your budget development process. So being queued off when the city budgets approved by the voters, if this were to go into effect now, then that notice of available funding would go out, you know, right at the start of, of July with the deadlines for applications to be able to come in in August and then flowing through the review of them so that by the time you're developing the budget at the end of at the end of the the calendar year, um, you'd have a sense of of where grants were were going out the the door was the main piece. The way the guidelines are written is you don't have to be tied to these dates. There's flexibility of 14 days after such and such. Um, but this was kind of the default that we laid out with that purpose in mind. Uh, this one. Okay. And then um, again, won't read these either, but we we did articulate what the roles and responsibilities would be for the for the city council, for the city manager, designate for the planning department and the, the housing committee, all having a role to play. In, in keeping uh, these these projects grants rolling and going to the most effective uh, purposes possible. Um, all right, that is the end of our presentation. Great, thank you. <laughs> and and again, if you could stop sharing. Yes, uh, absolutely. Thank you. I I have a question that I think I know the answer to, but I should be clear. The the hundred fifty thousand uh, dollars for the large projects that is a uh, hundred fifty thousand dollars in annual budget, not a hundred fifty thousand dollars in the trust fund at any given time. Is that right? It's the latter. It's every July first. You would do a, you would look at your trust. Like it's dependent on how much you allocate, right? But we have numbers on what is currently in the we fund. Currently, have two hundred and forty nine thousand dollars in the fund, approximately. So, um, and I think there was zero allocated for this budget year. But so we have that money. So if the city council enacted these changes, then on July first, the city would advertise, you know, the request for proposals for development projects, um, and the city would have. 150,000 for a project. If a project comes forward this year that meets the criteria and that you wanted to fund, um, and then there's an additional 100,000 that could be available for the ADU um, and shared equity programs. Um, we discussed at length with the housing committee whether or not we should be continuing to keep a balance in the fund. And the overall thinking was that we're in a housing crisis and that we probably shouldn't be sitting on the money <laughs> mm -hmm. and that we should be getting it out there. So if there isn't a, a major project in that year, get it out the door. If people want to build ADUs on their property, do it. <laughs> if we can get more like affordability, you know, properties in the flow for down street, do it. Um, and so that was the the thinking there. I, I think that's great because what we what we've learned with the other projects that you've mentioned is that to build a project like uh, 
French Block or any of the other projects, there there could be ten or more funding sources. And what other funding sources have told us is that even having one hundred fifty thousand dollars, which is not a large amount in comparison to the total uh, cost of the project, but that uh, helps attract other money from other funders. And so we always want to have city money going into the, a project like this. Anybody have any other questions? Okay. Is there a motion to approve the uh, new, oh, Steve? Yeah, yeah. I'd like to make a comment and you've heard it before, uh, especially when you're channeling money to nonprofits, you're outsourcing a government function to a nonprofit like Downstreet. I saw a reference to Good Sam. We need to maintain, we need to put contractual requirements that provide some level of transparency similar to public records law. That there's there's real problems with maintenance and accountability within Downstreet, their overcapacity, their treatment of tenants based on who's paying full fare and who's subsidized. And those issues you don't uncover unless you have some public records accountability. So here's a place where you're talking about giving money to Downstreet, and we need transparency into those programs. So now is the time to do it because you're remodeling the the program. So I'd say postpone a vote on this and have them come back with some proposals to ad address that. Okay, thank you. Did you read this, Stephen? Did you read the proposal? I think they've addressed it. I guess that's why I'm... No, I mean, there's, there's no mechanism in here to... to require the beneficiaries. I'm, I'm not talking about the individual home owner who's putting an ADU in. I'm talking about when we're handing it off the task of managing the loan program or the grant program to Downstreet. That's where this would kick in because that's a program that creates a big bureaucracy and, and shields the problems uh, that they're having because they're not subject to public records law. Is that clear? Yeah. yeah, I'll just say that we we have tried to to really focus on accountability in the work that we did with the revisions um, and have some clear requirements for the planning department and the city in terms of creating very clear contracts um, that are accessible um, with the contracted entities, which would likely be downstream. Yeah, I, I hope we've addressed that or we've thought a lot about it. But I think yeah. so. Point good. Good point. But Downstreet is not subject to public records law. But it still needs mob. We, yeah, it's all right. It's in here is to my side. So I would like to move that we approve the guidelines for the Montpelier Housing Trust Fund and thank the efforts of the committee. Uh, it's an incredible effort and very grateful for your year and a half's work on this. Thank you. I'll second. Any further discussion? Yeah, Mayor Sal. Uh, I, I too would like, like to commend you for the amount of work you've been into this. I mean, the the 2018 uh, guidelines were three pages. We now have 13 pages, so we did clarify in that detail. Um, it would have helped me if I had a summary of what you changed, because you changed the approach to some things. You know, you sort of reversed the way things were treated um, in certain places. I managed to do it by taking both documents and doing a word compare, you know, and I got to see all the changes, but just for future reference to go from three pages to 13, there was a lot of new, you know, a lot of new stuff and I didn't know what, what had been changed. So it would have been helpful, but um, yeah, we probably I, should have I, you a did cover a letter or given you the PowerPoint earlier. <laughs> you did a pretty, pretty thorough job. So thank, thank you. you for that. Yeah, I actually asked uh, Emma if there was a red line version, and she explained to me very I have appropriately I have. <laughs> that uh, when you're when you're doing change? such a major rewrite of the policy, it's really not feasible <laughs> to do a red line. Red line would be difficult. I commend you for yeah, for doing it. 
But yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, I think definitely sometimes we also we have conversations with the full housing committee. And so, you know, we're in the process of talking about those things over time. And this is the first time I think the full council is hearing it. So um so no, great job. Good. I mean, I don't mean to criticize, just just something to think about next yeah. time you yeah. six years from now you redo it again. <laughs> yeah. All right. Any further discussion? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Thanks for doing this. Thank you so much. <laughs>
Um, so we were charged with getting some more information about that. We held a meeting uh, with state officials last week. The mayor sat in. So I don't know if you want to add anything about that, um, Mr. Mayor. Well, I, I thought it was a very encouraging meeting. You know, people were uh, expressing concerns of, of a number about a number of questions, including uh, are the is the state going to uh, impose a lot of uh, of red tape in order to uh, to draw down the funds and are we going to be uh, having conversations with these guys only to have them uh, come back with the uh, requirements from the higher ups who are uh, who are going to make it worse than we anticipate it's going to be and uh, possibly most, and and it was very clear to me that we're we were meeting with the people who are making the decisions, they're setting the standards, and they're uh, and they're going to be uh, getting this done very quickly. Um, there was uh, also a question. Uh, that we were discussing last time about well, how long is it going to take to uh, to get uh, get co elevation contractors, and could we accelerate that process if we had uh, more of our money uh, to invest in that process? And what we were told was that uh, there really doesn't seem to be any. Uh, good evidence to uh to demonstrate that having uh, that throwing more money at that is going to enable the uh attract uh elevation contractors who aren't already ready to go but i think bill has some information about that so i think there were a few thank you mr mayor there were a few Key takeaways. One is that the um, they're going to release immediately $1.4 million of that to Barry and Montpelier. Don't know the exact division, but if, assuming it was 700000 that would be able to do possibly as many as four elevations, depending on the prices. Um, so that would be able to be moved. They are, um, they are, they are going to allow us to begin work to get elevation certificates and engineering designs done um, even before the state can release the money that they'll reimburse us afterwards so we can incur city costs to do that uh, with with um, on their nickel um, that they have actually more money than 3.5 million there's specifically 3.5 million for um, home residential elevations but there are other additional programs uh, that were also got funded this year to deal with flood uh, uh, repair that could be eligible. So if we needed more money for whatever reasons, there are additional funds available and they're going to be seeking proposals. And after they sort of hit the first two big ones, which are us and Barry, they'll be seeking proposals for the rest of the funding and hoping to use all their money, not just this money. Uh, so we laid out plans where we'd like to see uh, basically the work done in two pods. So one group of work on Lower State Street, where we do all the homes together and ideally accelerate the build out of Ed Haggett's house, the buyout, not the build out, the buyout. Um, so that that house could be purchased and then that site could be used as the staging area for the rest of the projects to be coordinated and then a similar effort at Elm Street. So that's what we propose to them. We also talked to them about the possibility of using some of these funny fundings to accelerate buyouts. Um, and they said they were also considering that um, one of the positives of this is if we were to use city or combination of state monies as opposed to FEMA money is, Ed, do you mind if I use your home as an example? No, you don't mind? Okay, yeah, okay. So for, say for example, we were able to purchase Ed's home and he gets his buyout and gets his fair market value and leaves. If FEMA does that, first of all, it's going to take longer, but also it has to then be raised and the property can't be used for anything else ever. If the city or state were to buy it, we could take it down, use it to help stage, and then maybe work with a downstreet or someone to put in a properly constructed, elevated 
you know, multifamily, you know, five or six units there. So it could be put back into productive use, but protected by, you know, elevated. So state understands that that would be a way to have more housing uh, that could happen. So we are trying to figure that out, but that is, that's a theory at this point that is a potential um, to speed that up. Uh, I'm trying to take a, just lost my notes here. Um, so, yeah, so that's basically, so we will be beginning the elevations. Uh, so the next thing that's happened, we've sent them a list of the properties we expected to work on. We expect to get approval of that immediate turnaround. Once we do that, then the property owners would agree to that and we can get all that done. Uh, and then start looking for contractors. We've already started looking and have identified uh, contractors that are available in the area could actually do work this summer or fall, uh, at least one set of the work. Um, so we are pushing to move on that. Um, so that's where that is at. Um, those are the options. I mean, there's so again, I'm, I'm I know I'm probably repeating myself. There will be the immediate dis dispersal of funds somehow allocated between Montpelier and Barry then a process where we can submit for additional projects and additional funding along with other communities in the state, but it's not limited to just 3.5 million. They, and they are, what their goal is, is to take, because some of the other projects have different eligibility, they can try to match the, the proposals to the, the funding. Ours are pretty straightforward. It's residential elevations, which is what we asked for the money for. So ours would most likely come from these, but that's what they told us. Um, and then I, asked for what I could say today in public. And I was told that I could say they would be releasing the 1.4 million to Barry and Montpelier um, soon. So that's what I have to report from that meeting. Thanks, Bill. Um, and again, the mayor was there. If you, you heard anything different, please. <laughs> As it happened, we were at the same meeting and we heard the same stuff and I don't have anything to contradict what you said. I think, yeah, I think the, the meeting went quite well. And uh, as I said, I, I was encouraged uh, by what I heard. Um, now we're sharing the, uh, I think we're sharing the funding uh, pool table and for for people who want to uh, who are following along at home or who want to understand this more, um, in the budget, in the section titled the Budget Adjustment Act, we have uh, an allocation of uh, what is it three hundred forty nine thousand dollars for general fund, and well we had, right. We would start with the sources of funds. Okay. So there were three sources of funds that we were looking at for this. One was uh, our, there are remaining ARPA funds, which was just under $740,000, which we need to get obligated. The second was the state's budget adjustment money that they gave to us as a revenue, uh, basically to recognize our lost revenues. Uh, that was $825,000. And the third was the... Um, lease revenue that we received from FEMA of 514000 um, So those are the three sources of funds we were looking at. At the last meeting, you approved the use of some, um, and then um, and then we've had a couple of, you know, we've had some additional information come in and change, and then we even have more suggestions for things that you can take off the list and add to the list or whatever um, to me. And we have a memo from you. Yeah, but I can. I also will go through it again. I don't want just, just so everyone. Can, okay. Yeah. There's only a handful of people. Do you think we get photocopies for five or six copies? Right. Let's we'll oh, see how it goes. Yeah. It'd be any less visible. Right. Yeah. Because it's <laughs> it, it's not just the size. It's also it's kind of a light 
yeah color against the white backgrounds so all right so we'll get uh photocopies of all that in the meantime um and it is on the screens of people at home and we have them here yeah it's actually easy to read on the computer screen and on that screen so i just had a couple of notes i sent out to you i'll just say this so everyone can hear it um on this list is a door lock system for the city hall. You actually had already approved that uh, expenditure at an earlier meeting, um, but it wasn't in the list of things that we approved last time. <laughs> so it'd probably be good if we paid it. Um, the fire truck, we had uh, we have our insurance money and we had put 50,000 in capital reserve uh, for the replacement truck for one that burned. We'd popped another $50,000 here. Um, as a hedge in case uh, we needed it, we don't think we will need it. So that is $50,000 that could be reallocated uh, to other purposes, if you wished. Uh, the fence for $40,000, um, we understand that there's a lot of questions about the fence. We're not sold ourselves. Um, we were gonna talk to the homelessness task force, but probably in the, in the realm of priorities that could be reallocated elsewhere. People had raised the issue about CityBot and had some questions. Um, this was really proposed in response to sort of concerns we've heard that it's hard to search our website. Um, it is a proven platform on other city websites. I know we we got a demo from us that wasn't a complete version, but nonetheless, it's not the highest priority that we have. Um, we could we could certainly reallocate that, um, and then so that. Those three together are just a little over $100,000. Uh, then we have the sectional plow blades for $50,000. We do need those. There's a kind of rubber blades, and they, they're actually very helpful because they help. They, we can reduce a lot of salt use, so we save money. Um, but the School Street project, and you would see at the, the things that already were funded, um, were largely to get that, that School Street project completed. We just opened the bids. And uh, they did come in high, so we would like if there if there were an approval, the ability to use some up to all, but of this money for the school street project. But if not, what we don't use, we can use for plow blades. Um, and then just in terms of you know how much money there is to move around, there was if you look at the initial proposal at the bottom, there was sixty one thousand unallocated, and then. Um, there was again just this quote that we got from Doug Farnham today from the state that we can that we will be getting at least our share of 1.4 million between Barry and Montpelier and additional funding to come. And then lastly, there had been some suggestions put out by council members, not obviously the full council, uh, that totaled about 208,000. So there would be about 161,000 that could be reallocated. So that we'd still. If we funded everything on the council list, we'd still have to find forty-seven thousand dollars. So I think that's the quick summary of where we are at. Karen, I have a question about the ARPA funding. Um, what I remember when I started on the council it was it had happened before I started, but that a certain amount, four hundred and some thousand dollars, had been set aside from the ARPA for homelessness and for addressing homelessness in some way. Um, I think it, we used some of it, like maybe 15,000, 10 to 15,000 to pay consultants to do a study. Um, I don't have a memory of spending any of the rest of it. And I also don't have a memory of deciding not to spend it in that way. And so I'm wondering about the history of that. Sure. Um, this is my first question. Okay, um, and we'll have to, we can track that back for you. I don't have it. So, um, and Sarah, correct me if I'm wrong on this, or maybe she's already got the answer to that. I we I think we also used some of that for the the architectural study on the Barry Street building, but on the right that was the follow up of that yep, homelessness yep. task force. Yep. Um, but when we had the budget shortfalls, um, we basically wiped out all the ARPA clean and said, we're going to reallocate all of it just to basically make up for our revenues. So that was in the budget adjustment that we made, if I'm correct. And I want to make sure I am, uh, but I think what, that's- And what, when, when did we do that? Yeah, I'll let the expert talk. 
uh, that was part of the deficit mitigation plan. Mm -hmm. um, so we basically wiped all of that funding um, with the exception of the 300,000 that was allocated towards the rec center grant match. Um, and so in this proposal, it's just pivoting that rec grant match out of ARPA and down um, into the FEMA lease revenue line because the ARPA money needs to be obligated by the end of this calendar year. And the best case is that we spend it by the end of this calendar year, we risk having to return it to the federal government. And we can't spend, we can't use the rec center. We can't. It won't be in time. That in time. Yeah. It's a, and it's also a match, a federal match yeah, for so federal men. May, there may be matching issues. Okay. Okay. So I still think it was a good idea to set money aside um, and so I, I would love to try to preserve that spirit as much as we possibly can. Um, and so for instance, I see in the budget adjustment act funds, there's $15,000 for parks, ADA restroom, and it says cut from ARPA. Can we put that back and use ARPA money for that? Since public restrooms were definitely a big thing on our list to use that $400,000 for. I mean, good. Yeah, we could. Um, if we can okay. do it by the end of the calendar year. That would the the purpose of allocating the funds towards ARPA was to get things spent down that were still priorities that yeah. still needed to be. So, so there might be a, a question of the feasibility of doing that doing by the that end of December thirty first. Got it. And to be clear, just so everyone to to keep everyone up, when you uh, the matching issue that uh, that you and Bill mentioned is that the grant for the uh, rec center is federal money and we can't Our, use- Our money is federal money too. And it gets tricky when you match federal with federal, there's very specific rules. They're expecting us to use our own money as the match basically. Yeah, or non-federal money. Okay, thanks. And this is a little bit of a stretch. I'm not trying to rationalize this, but the the impetus for pursuing, so the, the line of, the line when we had the, the the consultant study about homelessness who said you should look at the rec building. So that caused us to do the architectural study of the rec building who came back and said, here's all the things that you need if, if you were to convert it to either a shelter and or housing in the long run. And some of it was all these systems needs. So we applied for a grant and this is to set that building up for future use. So arguably it is in fact the same it is being used for housing and homelessness purposes. Obviously, we haven't made a final decision about the use of that building. But if you recall the architectural pro proposal, it talked about the ability to convert that building to transitional housing, basement shelter, permanent basement shelter, and upper floor housing of, I want to say 10 units, but I could be wrong about that. And But all of this work, all of the the... HVAC work, all of the electrical work, all of the upgrade, the asbestos removal, all that stuff it has to be done regardless of what we use it for. Um, but certainly in terms of being able to market it to another, if we were to go ahead with another rec center somewhere, we would, the idea was this, we would transition this into a community facility for dealing with unhoused people. So that, I mean, that is the continuum of this project. It's, we're not necessarily putting this money in just to keep it as a rec center. Although, you know, that could happen. I can't say that it won't happen, but, but that's not the plan. And of that money, we've spent about 35000 and it's been on um, the Parker report, the report bill is just mentioning, and some asbestos removal. Tim. The ball is bounced since we did all these conversations with the flood last July, but it feels to me like just, it's a question that the long way to get there is going to be I mean, my gut feeling is that the bike path issue is there's a basic lack of public restrooms. It's part of the reason why that's so bad over there at the moment. And people are going down the riverbanks to try to go to the bathroom and it's just awful. Um, I also think, at least in my mind, that the ideal location for public restrooms is probably more in this area, like in this building, than on Barry Street right now. And when we had the Parker report, we didn't have the lower level of city hall wiped out um but is there a way we can turn around this money by the end of the year to create public restrooms in this building um that would be closer to the police station it would be central downtown 
<laughs> I think that there is the potential um, through the FEMA process to get public restrooms put back into this building um, that would be outward facing. Um, I, do I think that would happen with FEMA in this year? No, but I do think that there's a portion of funding available from them that could help pay for this um, without needing to use money we already have or this money that's set aside for other things. Um, so that, you know, when, as we work on this building rebuild, they, you know, have to make us whole to codes and standards. And part of that is we had ADA accessible restrooms in the basement and we no longer have that. Um, so as part of our recovery, mm -hmm. we should be able to work restrooms of some kind that are public facing into and that. We've, we've actually insisted on that in any of the designs that it'd be actually a more accessible public restroom. Uh, and we had talked about whether I, one of the versions where they talked about expanding in the back would have one. We've even talked about where the planning office used to be. There's an external door and cementing that in. So even if we got, even if the rest of the basement got filled, that could be have an accessible ramp or something left or something is going in and then have public bathrooms there. But even if they filled with water, they could just be pumped out and, you know, have metal facilities in the so we're we've asked them to sort of cost that out and that may or may not be fema eligible so if it's not that could be you know something we would do on our own but those are that's what we've been pushing for because i agree with you that this location is better than that other location yeah adrian yes i hope you all can hear me i think my internet at the hotel is getting a little funky oh we hear you okay good good because you're all freezing up on my end. So I just want to make sure I come through um, loud and clear. So I was looking at the budget and I just want to go through some, I I think, I mean, I, I put the budget into an Excel spreadsheet and move stuff around. So, um, and so I'm just going to go through this just to, to see if what, if this makes sense. I can't share my screen, I don't think, but hopefully you all can follow me. So for the pavement, so in all the yellow, Adrian, yeah, we've we've just been told you can share. Oh, your screen good. You oh, to. that will be so much better. <laughs> okay, good. Let me just see if I can do this. Okay. Oh, that'll make life so much easier. Okay. So I was just kind of doing some quick cut and pasting onto my Excel spreadsheets because that does automatic math for me, and I I'm not going to do math at this hour of the night. So. Um, we have the yellows. I didn't put the um, descriptions over here, but this was the Barry Recovery, School Street Pipe Lining, School Street Sidewalks, the Paving, and the Meadow Structure. So those were all already approved. So those were in yellow. Then we have the Pavement Conditions, which was $25,000 to expand work to include sidewalks, the Fire Gear, which was $25,000, the Locks, which we've already approved, I don't know. I moved City Bot out of here. I mean, we can definitely have this up for discussion, but I just moved it out just to see what it would look like. Um, we have the forty thousand dollars, and I put restrooms. Maybe we can kind of move that or re, um, you know, allocate that kind of based on our discussion. The police vests twenty five thousand dollars, blades fifty thousand dollars, air bottles twenty thousand. Um, Lauren's going to talk about a potential proposal that she sent the council for allocating $100,000 to the Montpelier Commission for Recovery for flood projects that they're going to propose. So I threw that in there. So that came out to $823,500. Then we had the FEMA, which was three ninety-five, two fifteen, one fifty, fifteen thousand dollars. And I put, you know, can we maybe move this down? you know, the $40,000 here. So it's $55,000 to look at restrooms, even possible showers, temporary, um, you know, something that we can just kind of, you know, save, you know, both our police department and folks from falling down the bank because that's the terrible situation. Um, I moved the fire engine over because we said we didn't need to do that. So that brings us to $775,000. Then we have the rec center, $300,000. CCR development grant 150, so that's 450. And so that leaves us with, I don't, I, we can definitely double check this math, but if we kind of move stuff out and like reallocate some of these um, items, I think that still leaves us with $26,655 as a, a, a plus to kind of move around and play with. Um, did I get that math right? 
<laughs> the uh, the ARPA money, we only have 700 and some thousand dollars of ARPA money. So we can't allocate 823,500 from ARPA. So that the total was 739, is that what it was? 739, right? Yeah, 739. Yeah. Okay, thank you. All right, so then we're- this is, And this is very minor. Um, it, it doesn't change your math at all, but the engineering services 150 was already approved. So that should actually be in yellow. Which one was? Oh, this one, okay. Yeah. Okay, all right. So we're still, then we're like almost $100,000 over. All right. I didn't realize the level, the um, that was the max for ARPA. Oh, or maybe it was 736. 739. The ARPA money left is 736. There's some round, give or take rounding. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we'll have to, so anyway, Lauren has her hand up. I'm going to stop sharing. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Adrian and Lauren. Hey, thanks and apologies. I'm not feeling well, so sorry if I'm not very coherent. Um, and I think John Copans might be in the room with you all, um, the executive he director is. of the commission. So I'm hoping he might have a more coherent <laughs> um, explanation, but I did email you all, um, but wanted to share for uh, the public's benefit. Um, so the Commission for Recovery and Resilience uh, met the other night and were thinking about uh, these funding sources and um, were requesting that the city set aside $100,000 for projects that are being developed by the commission. Um, as folks who might have seen the recent public forum, we are at the stage where we have um, have a list of priority projects. Um, these, again, were you know ideas and, that were developed from the community input from public forums. And then the commission has been doing a lot of work to kind of vet and research and look for where we could make the biggest impact. So projects like implementing a downtown building survey, um, a river's edge master plan, um, flood mitigation projects and so on. And, you know, I know that in our strategic plan, we're talking about shortly, we've identified that, you know, working on these types of projects is a priority. Um, so just putting aside, you know, this, pot of money. So the request right now is not like this is going to a specific project, but let's designate it so that we can, so that the commission could come back and make a specific proposal for a specific project. So this would not be looking to just kind of fund the commission generically. It would be more set aside. So there could be further council conversation around a specific project where um, city investment does make sense. And the commission is working really hard to look at, you know, all kinds of different funding sources and partnerships and all that. Um, but we anticipate that some city investment will be essential to moving these projects forward. So that's the that's the idea. And maybe John, um, I, I don't know the order you want to go, Jack, but hopefully he could have a chance to speak at some point and say it more coherently. <laughs> yeah, this would be the time. Why don't you come on up, John? Uh, thanks so much, uh, Council, and thanks, Lauren. I, I mean, I actually think Lauren covered it pretty well. You know, why do you identify yourself? Sorry, uh, John Copans, uh, the Executive Director of the Montpelier Commission for Recovery and Resilience. And as I think folks know, we are sort of moving from broader categories of work around uh, uh, creating a more adaptive downtown, uh, building flood resilience uh, projects in the watershed, and really strengthening our emergency preparedness and emergency response plans. Uh, we're moving from that general work towards more specific uh, priorities. And that would include, as Lauren mentioned, a downtown building survey. Essentially, there was about 90 to 100 uh, buildings in downtown that were impacted by this flood. And our sense is that uh, the building owners could use a couple of things at this point as they consider how best to flood proof those buildings. One a real sense of what that flood uh, design elevation level is for them. They they need to understand in their building what they need to plan for, for, for flood elevation, A, and B, some sense of where they can best put their resources to flood proof those buildings. And so what we envision is, now this won't be full like engineering development for each of these buildings, but instead uh, a, um, 
a, a basic sense for each one of these building owners of what the potential projects look like for them, in part because we know some of these building owners are already making investment, and we want to be sure they're doing that in an informed way where they are getting the most out of what they're they're investing in, uh, and in part because we think there are also some financial resources that can be brought to bear to do that work for them. So that's an example of the sort of project that we're working on where, and, and to be honest, I'm talking with city staff about that very project as something that we're going to collaborate on. So like the sense that this is sort of designating something sort of for the commission, I, I want to sort of like correct and be clear like that we really see ourselves as working hand in glove with you all in pushing these uh, uh, strategic priorities forward. It would be tremendously helpful to have some sense that, okay, there is this pot of money to draw down from as we really develop these projects as um, as a resource. I don't want to give any illusion that this 100,000 covers all of this work by any scope, right? But knowing that uh, we can then come back to you with more specifics as these projects hit readiness it would be tremendously helpful as we go out there with other partners uh, to really raise uh, the funds we feel like are going to be necessary to get this work done. Thank you. Thanks. Anyone have any questions for him while he's up? Okay. Thanks so much. Thanks. Okay. Who's up next? I have a couple more questions. Um, now I've lost it. Hang on. So under the FEMA lease revenue, section there's the ccr development contract can you tell me what that is um i'm not sure it should be called contract per se that is the cost to do um the engineering work that we need to do the, if you recall we set out a plan i can't remember february march where we laid out the, the process and we do, we we're going to do engineering and apply for the tiff so these are the next phases of that work that we haven't yet funded under the Budget Adjustment Act, we have engineering services. That for... is different. So that was that is for public works to do projects because they've not been able to hire. They just coincidentally are the same amounts of money, but they're for two completely different things. It's for, I think there was a list of eight or 10 specific projects that we are getting outside engineering for of different types of expertise. So, um, and because we have been unable to hire a staff person, council approved this money to move those projects along. So two, they're both engineering, but two different things. <laughs> Thank you. I, I'm I'm trying to look at all of these sources of funds and with their the sort of intention behind them in mind. Um now, the ARPA money, we're so far away from COVID, addressing COVID fallout that it's kind of hard to do that. But um, one of the things about ARPA is it's not supposed to be for ongoing expenses, right? It's kind of one-time stuff. So I would like to try to preserve that. The Budget Adjustment Act money um, was given to us by the legislature to try to address shortfalls that came about because of the flood. So anything that addresses that. Um, so I'm, So I don't yeah. And then the FEMA lease revenue um, seems like it should go either towards Country Club Road development, since that's what the money was was being paid for, or towards um, flood recovery mitigation, that kind of thing. And so I also understand that we might need to do some creative moving around because we can't we have to spend the ARPA money by the end of the year. So that's where I'm getting a little bit hung up on how to accomplish that. Um, I I think it's really important for us to spend some money on the Montpelier Commission for Recovery and Resilience. Um, seems like it makes the most sense to me that it would come out of that FEMA lease revenue rather than anywhere else, personally, if we're gonna try to preserve that, so. That's what I, I I get the buckets. Um, 
I can make sure we get the money spent in the ARPA bucket first for one-time things. If that is reallocating, for example, the engineering services, we didn't know how quickly we would use that money, which is why we didn't plot that to ARPA. But we could use some of that towards the ARPA and just reposition the other funding. So I, mm -hmm. I feel comfortable in managing the different pots of money to be sure we're in compliance with the different requirements, okay. if that's helpful. That's really helpful. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I think from our perspective, it was really just these are the the needs, and there's a whole list of needs underneath that are, un, are not funded, and this is the funds that we have available. And with the with the only two caveats that we couldn't really use the the what we had intended to use ARPA for the three hundred thousand for the rec center to match a, a grant, so we had to put that somewhere else, and then they also the need to get stuff that we could spend uh, quickly. Um, in the ARPA money and otherwise it was just you know the short the, the budget shortfalls are what they are and that's what that money was for and then we're just trying to fit everything else in within the funding that we had Adrian sorry I'm such a visual person <laughs> so I updated my spreadsheet um with actually just making sure that that ARPA was close to that 736. So can I share that again? Sure. To see if this makes sense. Okay. I'm like, I have to see things. That's how my brain works. Um, so once again, I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but I did put the, um, once again, I don't know, we can be up, this could all be up for discussion, but I removed city bot, which we can put it back in. Um, I had that $40,000 here. We can move that. Once again, this is just kind of in those buckets that we just talked about. Um, and so if we moved CityBot out um, of the ARPA, that brings us down to 723, which is you know still a little bit below the 736. So we could always add some more back to that budget. We can move that around. Um, the budget adjustment, you know, we we're gonna keep the 150,000 dollars in for public works. I don't know if we can do a hundred thousand dollars. I mean, I'd love to have a hundred thousand dollars set aside for, you know, flood recovery projects. I think that's going to be huge, right? So the commission's working on these projects. I know they're going to do fundraising, but you know, how can we as a city support those projects? I think that's something that we could discuss, but I don't know how we move that money around. So if even if we did a budget adjustment and kept 50,000 aside, that still leaves us at that $825,000, which is what I think we had for budget adjustment. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, FEMA, we have 450, so you still have that rec center grant match and the development grant, which is $150,000. So I think there's still some money that we can move back into ARPA. You know, it's about $10,000. We can move back up here from, you know, maybe one of these projects that, you know, that we, you know, it's like that one-time funds that we just have to spend. Um, and I don't know if we want to look at some of these numbers to see if we want to, you know, increase the Montpelier Commission for recovery or, um, you know, what do we want to do with these $40,000 for the, you know, the fence? I mean, you know, do we want to wait to get a recommendation from the home Homelessness Task Force? I just don't know what to do, but this is kind of what I looked at in terms of the numbers and how we can move them around. If that makes sense to anyone other besides me. <laughs> oh, it, it, I totally see where you're coming from. I think it makes sense. Steve, you've been standing up for a while. I'm wondering if you're seeking to be recognized. Why don't we do that now? Uh, Steve Whitaker, the... I had put a request in a couple of days ago to ask about the status of that uh, homelessness task force ARPA reservation that had not been committed. So I was glad to hear uh, Carrie ask that question and discover that it has been scooped out. And But I, I want to point out that the five years ago we created the homelessness task force and the priorities were bathrooms, showers, phone charging, lockers, and one other. Um, 
We've we've accomplished li literally none of those. We've lost bathrooms. We our best bet for bathrooms would be to insist that the Green Mountain Transit lease be renegotiated. We take those bathrooms, put a shower in one of them, and we staff them and clean them. Uh, in effect, Green Mountain Transit needs only the glass cage. They do not need the entire lobby. Um, we're getting giving them that for a dollar a year. I still don't know if the handicap door has been repaired. Uh, that's one of the things that we should hear back, reported back from, rather than, you know, keep saying it year after year. Um, I know you took an interest in that. The Taylor Street handicap door paddles had never been installed. Um, so transit re transit center is the best and quickest way to use ARPA money to get those bathrooms, get a shower in one of them. We could even put lockers in the transit center, large size backpack size lockers to accommodate some of this. The shower, if it's there, should be scheduled not on peak transit hours because you often need riders need two bathrooms to get in and off the bus, but people could schedule when they want to get in there and get a shower. Um, that's a workable model that could be accomplished this year. I do, I do not like seeing failed planning costing us access to that money we set aside for this purpose years ago. Um, Elks Club, the Pod Village concept to uh, create emergency housing and, and trigger state funding uh, to finance our carrying costs and engineering work is a very viable, but it would need to be started now to get toilet and shower insulated trailers in time for this winter. That That's intensive planning that has not been done. Uh, restroom trailers, shower trailers, and surface electrical, you know, you need a electric rubber heating mat in, in each pod. Uh, not high current, but enough for a phone, phone charging, a reading light, and enough heat to keep these things from freezing. Um, School Street, I'm, con I'm concerned that the I'm only seeing water mains discussed on School Street, whereas I understand that there was a requirement. I'm talking to Kurt. We needed to do the stormwater and the sewer under there. It's all, it's all being done. Okay. So it that's included in the numbers. That, that alarmed me that we were only talking about water and not wastewater and stormwater. So... Um, Wait a minute. Just double checking that. I'm pretty sure some of that is included in this number, and some of this is budgeted in those funds. Right. So we had. So we have, this, uh, this is additional money to what we'd already set aside. This okay. Was, this, so the, there is money enough to complete know, the, the whole street. school street. I, I didn't want that to be a surprise. Uh, the lidar I had suggested that years ago, and I finally am delighted that it's been in the budget for a couple of years, but it's been postponed. Uh, that's the most cost-effective way to com get a complete inventory of the condition of our roads and sidewalks. So I would like to see you address that. City bot is not is not ripe. We need to redo our website and get our domain on a .gov before we consider an AI bot. We do not want to add an AI bot to a crap website. Uh, and we did have 50,000. Has that 50,000 been spent or is it too been swept up into a uh, fill the whole fund. We did not get a new website. We, we put $50,000 into budget a, a year or two ago for that. And we got the same crap website we had then. Yeah, we did upgrade all of it. Well, no, we didn't because we there was no process to discuss what software, what feature set. I mean, if if one person did it and did it the same way as before, it, it's not an upgrade. Um. Ten five thousand is not enough to do a emergency action plan. I I've been critical of the plan. All right, Steve, I'm going to interrupt you here just because I'm going to give you facts about this. This is a contribution to the to the uh, Montpelier Recovery and Commission plan. What is it about fifty thousand you're spending? And this is a city. They asked for ten percent of it from the city. Okay, that's fine. And yeah, I just want exactly what you talked about: community plan to deal with. All right, I knew you office. couldn't do it for five thousand. Why? So I was calling it. So that's that's fine. To interrupt me on that one. Um, I think I made my points. Transit center priority, offense to to 
keep people from using the restroom when we got we haven't dealt with the restroom shortage and the accessible long hours accessible restroom is uh, a smarter investment than a fence. Um, before yeah. Steve spoke, I was just going to respond to what Adrian had said. Um, she was laying out. I I'd offer a suggestion simply that you all should figure out how you want to spend all where you want to put all of these funds. We can make sure they're in the right buckets. I don't I don't think there's a lot of value added for you all to be worried about what you're taking from which source, as much as saying there's this total sum of money because you can get yourself down a rabbit hole that way. It's like you've got was it two well, it's two thousand and seventy-five thousand, two two million and seventy-five thousand dollars to work with, and how do you want to reallocate that? I think that's really your, and how you want to do that. And you've got this proposal. We just gave you some suggestions, and you've made offered a few suggestions. And then there's the list down below of things that you know we would have moved forward with under normal circumstances that we're not. So, and the dollars are fungible. Yeah. Basically, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that with the, yeah, well, we'll make sure that they get in the right bucket. Just knowing, I think that the key rules is we can't match federal money with federal money. So, and obviously there's a bunch of things we want to make sure that we're spending stuff that we can spend by year end. Mm -hmm. All right. So hearing that, does anyone have a list of items where they just want to say, propose we we spend this, we don't spend that, and make may it add up to the dollars we want to make it add up to? Carrie. Okay. Uh, I don't know if my math is going to be right on this, but um, if we do not spend 10500 on CityBot, and we do not spend 50,000 on the fire engine. And we still have 61,000 that was unspoken for in the original right. plan. That is more than 100,000. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's 121.6. Yeah. So I mean, total of all of them. So we could have a thousand, a hundred thousand go towards the Commission for Recovery and Resilience and still have a little bit left over and do all the other things that are on the list. I think that works. And Adrian. I like that. And can we ensure that that $40,000 maybe combine it somehow with that $15,000 for parks ADA restroom to have some type of bathroom for you know public availability even if it's a short term solution i don't know about the transit center but i know that i'm here in pittsburgh and one of the big topics we've talked about this week in my public health conference is homelessness and they have those temporary um you know portable bathrooms with showers. I mean, that is one way that a lot of cities around the country are trying to, you know, until they come up with permanent solutions. I mean, homelessness is an international epidemic that is not unique to Montpelier. And so I know I've learned a lot this week in my conference, and that is one um, way that we could possibly use some of those funds to provide bathrooms so that the hypothesis is that they don't fall down the riverbed and go to the bathroom. Yeah. Um, I I like the allocation. I'm wondering about the restroom shower plan that Adrian's mentioning here. I I don't recall exactly from your earlier, there was an email, I think, about this, but does this, is this just the hardware or does this include maintenance and cleaning and that kind of stuff? So. After I got her email, I looked up, and it looks like purchasing the units is about 40000 I mean, there's a range, depending on what you get. I would assume 
-hmm. So we have not put a lot of research into this and we could you know, just hold the sum of money and come back with, you know, talk to the homelessness task force and come back yeah. with a recommendation. It's also a possibility. Um, but I think, so my thinking on those was number one, so some of them we saw had like China toilet seats, which I think would last about three days before they got smashed. And um, so I think, you know, there you'd want the ones, we'd want to find some with metal fixtures inside, things that were more um, resilient. Um, there is, you know, th these are independent units. They don't tie into water and sewer. So they, they, they need to have, be refilled with water. They need to be drained. There's, there is a fair amount of maintenance that involves them. And I don't know, I don't know what the extent of that is yeah. yet and what, what the commitment is to doing that. Um, so that would be certainly an additional need that we'd have to take care of because it, it is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It seems I guess it's been a topic for a while in the committee study. That, is there a report anywhere? Is there some, I mean, have we advanced anywhere on a recommended option or how to approach from this committee? No. Not specifically. So the, the couple of things that were looked at, as you, as you may recall, in the, the design study for the um, for the rec center, they did show how a front-facing shower, and I can't remember what the number was for that, um, and I think the could, yeah, so that was one option. We had obviously been looking for what we could do in this building. There, we, the immediate short term, real short, not, not great solution was putting out porta potties in a few places. Uh, those are not the best. Uh, so, um, yeah, it would seem like we've got buildings downtown. It's more, how can we focus on one of these buildings? Cause it's Vermont. You're not going to, I mean, something yeah. that's unheated makes no sense. So whether it's the rec building, it's this building. So if we do something here, do we lose FEMA money? Is that the implication? If we jumped in and got something going in this building? I, I can't answer I that yeah. per se. I um, mean, you know, FEMA has been tricky and there's been a lot of hoops to jump in and prior approval. So there is the potential that we could shell out our own money and not get reimbursed um, to do something quicker here. But if we did and that and also, didn't, but we wouldn't lose the rest of the project, right? We would just lose that money we invested in the bathrooms? I would think so. Okay. But, you know, I can't say that for certain. But of course, we've also had a couple of presentations from our consultants, and I think most people were leaning towards the plans that involve filling the basement with cement. <laughs> Yeah, but there's a portion of it we don't have to fill that could be used. I mean, you've got it's flexibility. Been, that, that, that could happen. It's yeah. true. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, I, I would rather spend $40,000 on providing some kind of public restroom access than a fence. Um, I, I don't know that we can work out the details of that right now, but can we, like, maybe we could say that that's where we want that $40,000 to go is to address, you know, mm -hmm. the needs of the people who are falling down the bank. Um, and then with the homelessness task force and with others, we could figure out a better way to spend that money. So, uh, and it's actually 61.5, right? Because you had, you used a hundred thousand of the 121.5. That's that you added up, right? No, you took out 10, 40,000 there. For the fence so right you took out the city bot you took out the fire truck you added the 61 that's 121.5 it leaves 61.6 it's really it leaves 61.5 it leaves really, 61, yeah, yeah, 40 for 60. the fence and then an extra 21 left over yeah. you know, but we took Adrian out had proposed combining the park bathroom in this for 55,000 and I think that park bathroom is going to be, if, if we don't spend it now, I think that's intended for Hubbard Park, right? So that's something that if we don't do now, we're going to have to do because that's part of our ADA plan. And we've done other uh, work up at Hubbard Park, but not that. So so that'll that'll be another year where we have to do that. whether we decide doing a uh, public bathroom downtown is more important this year than doing a 
a bathroom, an accessible bathroom at Hubbard Park. I think that's a reasonable choice to make. Well, all I was all I was trying to establish was the number that's that we've got. I mean, if we cut from what Kerry was talking about, if we cover everything. If we cut the including a hundred a hundred in commission to the commission, we still have sixty one five. No, Twenty thousand. If if she's including the fence money plus the leftover. 61.6. If we're only including the leftover, it's 21.6. I think she's including the, including the fence money, but she's proposing on setting it aside for a public restroom and shower. Well, so what I'm saying is what, we, what we're setting aside is 61.5, really, because we have that 21.5 <laughs> left over. Do we I, not? Well, right. Yeah. I, I think, I think you're saying the same things differently. I think what I heard Councilmember Brown say is we wanted to set aside $40,000 for to look and or the fifteen thousand and and that there, there would just be twenty one thousand un you haven't talked about unallocated, that last right. twenty one thousand yeah. or we could just leave sixty one thousand unallocated and come back but I think the idea the message I heard was we want to sort of redirect from a fence and get see what we can do to provide a short term bathroom solution. One of the things that I have heard. Uh, a number of times is well why don't we just renegotiate the contract with the uh with the transit company and my reaction is well we've got a contract and we could go go to them and say well we want to renegotiate it and they would presumably say well we're, no <laughs> we're satisfied with what we have i assume right it's a little more complicated. I mean, Steve is right that the contract does call for, um, you know, bathrooms being open and they are open at all the times that the that they are present. They've not funded um, that. We've been in con conversations with them about ex expanding their staffing and or co-locating a state facility there that would leave, have it expand its hours of being open so that there would be more bathroom hours. Which I'd like to see that happen. Yes, I think we all would like to see yeah. that. Carrie, do you want to take all the suggestions that you just laid out and make it into a motion? Um, yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, Mr. Clerk, get out your yeah. pencil. Or... <laughs> Turn the tape on this one. Okay. So I move that we allocate. Can I? I'll try it this way. All of the suggested expenses that came from city staff, with the following exceptions. So. We remove CityBot for $10,500. We remove the fire engine for $50,000. Yep. And we add in $100,000 for the Commission on Recovery and Resilience. And we direct the direct city staff to the forty thousand dollars for the fence. Allocated. We reallocate it towards addressing the needs of homeless people in downtown Montpelier. And does your proposal that, include the? Uh... It leaves like eighteen thousand or twenty thousand dollars unallocated and does your proposal involve also doing that that with the money for the that's in for the accessible bathroom in Hubbard Park Just leaving it there okay okay is there a second to that motion second is there anyone who thinks we're 
overlooking something that we really must not overlook. And, and I'll throw out an idea that uh, that we haven't talked about yet, but uh, I uh, brought it up in my uh, query to the city manager uh, this morning or this afternoon, which is that uh, the idea of uh, of doing city bot, and for some reason I keep thinking in my head of calling it Robo City, but the, but but the idea of city bot was to enhance. Uh, communication and access to information that's almost an even up trade for putting the uh times argus and bridge pages back in and so if we're looking for ways to communicate with our residents those that has some value to me and we might have freed up enough money to do that and I'm not saying that's part of your motion. I'm just putting it in as part of the conversation. And if people don't, if people want to shoot me down, happy, happy, shoot, shoot me down. I'll shoot you down. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I would, I didn't put it in my motion, but I'd rather see that extra money go towards addressing the needs of homeless people in some way. I just don't know what that is exactly. So that's why I didn't put it in there. But I, I don't think that the, the, uh, the pages in the newspapers are give us a whole lot of bang for our buck in terms of communication, and that might it, at that extra twenty thousand dollars might make a big difference with getting people access to restrooms, for instance. Okay, Tim, I, I do think it was brought up the pod community or some something for homeless or unhoused people at, at the Country Club Road property is going to be needed. Whether last year we used the building, but the pod community, having heard the presentation at the library on, on Burlington's, um, it's not too early to consider that, but that wouldn't be these funds. I think there is money apparently available through the state right now that, that might help us do that. We should get on that. All right, we have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion on this? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Thank you. We have uh, accomplished that. Oh, I'm sorry. Were you, you folks looking? Why don't, why don't you step up to the microphone? I, and I apologize that it wasn't perceiving that you were wanting to speak so yeah i mean that's why ed and i are here i mean while well, you're saying that there may be money coming there may be something happening we're still living in shells of houses while you're reallocating the five hundred fourteen thousand to other projects we have nothing it's a year and i don't have a kitchen and i know everybody's sick of hearing that me too but you're now allocating this money somewhere else again? We've seen nothing. We've seen nothing from FEMA. We didn't get the emergency housing. We were left all on our own. Thank goodness you were delighted that everyone found housing. We didn't. We didn't receive the services. We didn't receive assistance. And now you're reallocating that money while we still haven't gotten any help. I just don't understand how the money that was supposed to provide us housing during the winter still is sitting there. We still have nothing and you're allocating it to other projects. How can you keep doing this? We've seen no progress. I have no ceilings. I have no floors. I have no walls. Will I wait for decisions to get made? and you're allocating it to other projects. Well, we still have nothing. That seems so shameful. And while you're worried about spending the federal money in time, we sit with nothing. My kids are gonna graduate from high school and we still don't have a house back. 
I think this is a terrible thing to be doing before there's any progress for any of us. I mean, Katie can't move forward. Mary can't move forward. Ed can't move forward. I can't move forward. Reallocating the money again. We have nothing and we've gotten nowhere. I think it's terrible. Good night. Can I speak? Yep. Ed Haggett. I live at uh, 197 State Street. Um, the only real money we have right now, I feel, um, is from the FEMA lease. Real recovery money. That is real. I've been, I watch, I listen. The past week, the figure has changed from two. 2 million to 1.6. Now it's 1.4 today. It was 1.6 yesterday. I have it in writing. I see it. Um, I agree with Lisa. It's, it's a shame. I, you know, <clears throat> I'd like to have a bathroom, I guess, for homeless people, but I'd like to have a place too. Um, in a month, it will be a year. And I've been getting all these, and I appreciate the work that you've done. Okay. I really, really do talking with these people, but you know, the, the, the last agenda was likely we'll get the money likely doesn't work. Real money works. I know you're trying real hard, but for me, not knowing which way to move, trying to save every penny I can so I can get myself a house, working with SBA for 10 months, which was a complete disaster. They lost my application for seven weeks and just said, oh, oh well, too bad for you. Um, this just the other day I found out, oh, the city wants to buy my property. Well, woohoo. You know, that I appreciate that, you know, but it's, it's like an idea to speed here. It's right. an idea. Yeah. But we don't have any strategic plan of how that how these neighborhoods are going to look. We don't know if you can even elevate them because of the water that comes down the back, not only in the front, it comes down the back. We We don't have any of that information. So how can we make wise decisions? We can't. I guess my two minutes is probably up. But I have I, I agree with Lisa. Shame. Shame, shame, shame. But I do appreciate the efforts that are going on. I mean meeting meeting John, uh talking to him and uh Suzanne and all the other people that I've been trying to work with, trying to get this straightened out. I'm still my own fault probably. I'm still on a day bed in my daughter's den. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming in. So folks, I'm looking at the time and I'm looking at what we have left on the agenda. And um, I know that people, one, it's late, two, people are very tired, three, we we're hoping to uh, have the uh, strategic plan discussion as a workshop style thing on the in the middle of the room my suggestion is that we get here the uh the it, it, administration overview and revised communication plan if even that and then move the uh, strategic plan to our next meeting okay administration overview Some other stuff going for the next meeting, but yeah, see, see, we get it.
on light on or off? Um, we'll see what they look like. I. <laughs> I'm sure it'll be fine. Have a dimmer. Yeah. Yeah. I'll just run out to get to the car and get my shades. Yeah, it's just not on Zoom yet. Oh. Thanks, John. This is going to be a little bit of an unrehearsed tag team. Um, right? Right. Okay. Um, what we wanted to do, obviously, we've been going through all the other city departments, and we are going to do this very quickly tonight, um, or anyway, even if it wasn't 1015. But one of the things that I, I really want to emphasize when we're going through this, you'll hear from Kelly and I about the manager's office. You'll hear from Sarah about the finance office, and I think John about the clerk's office and then Evelyn with our communications plan. Um, what? Oh, Tanya's online. Okay, great. Excellent. We can have Tanya pop in about HR too. Super. But the real thing, and, and we will be very quick, The I think what one of the things we want to get across in addition to all the other work we do is you occasionally hear about, you know, how much we spend for administration and what stuff. And, and I think it's important to understand all the components of that, all the required functions that are in there. So our goal today, obviously we'll answer any questions, but is just to give you a quick whistle stop of the all the things that we are responsible for on your behalf and we meeting all these different departments. So um, just, so who are we? This is most of us, not all of us, uh, the city manager and assessor's office. Uh, you know, most of you know me, you know Kelly, you know uh, Mary and Jane in the office. Jane is a technically actually the ad ad assessor's administrative assistant, not the manager's, but you wouldn't know it. She's been a stalwart of our office for years and uh, has, has gone through that. In addition, uh, Evelyn's communication work falls under us. Yeah, Chris's uh, sustainability, who you've heard from separately, so you won't hear about that again today. And then Tanya, uh, sort of between Chris and I, is our HR director, and she falls kind of between the manager and finance. So you'll see pieces of uh, both of us with that. I'm going to let Kelly take the next few. Great. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Looks good. Okay. So um, what we wanted to do was just pull up what um, our part of the strategic plan was. So if we had a sixth goal, um, and so this is from the previous strategic plan. And so these are some of the component pieces that we work through, um, communicating effectively, increasing accessibility, diversity, and equity, and inclusion, and then um, enhancing capacity for city staff and council. Um, and so you can see from this slide, um, the details, it's a, a kind of hard to look at, um, but you kind of get the gist. Um, we've got council support, operations, the assessor's office, communications, policy implementation, and human resources. And we're going to get into some of those details in future slides. And so for the purposes of, you know, what Bill and I do, um, the highlights would be under the council support, which is, you know, preparing the agendas, constituent service, policy recommendations, as well as some of the operation pieces, um, you know, supervising and managing staff, um, special projects such as flood recovery or emergency management. And so Tanya is available online and can chime in here. Hi, everybody. I'm Tanya Chambers. I'm the HR director for the city of Montpelier. I'm going to 
how to make this quick. I know it's late. Um, so the HR role plays an important part in the beginning, middle, and end of the employee's time here at the city. Uh, this starts with hiring and onboarding of new employees. A uh, great hire is when you find an employee with the skills to successfully perform the tasks required to attain the strategic goals. I believe we've been extremely fortunate to have the staff that we do who work hard and bring to the table a ton of knowledge and know-how. Since most organizations can't operate without employees, it's important to make sure those employees have full access to and knowledge of all their benefits. Those benefits being Blue Cross, um, health insurance, the dental, um, our vision, our, our retirement plans, so on and so forth. In addition to uh, the wellness initiative that Blue Cross and Blue Shield provides, which is an additional $9,000 that they give us to spend on the wellness of our employees. Uh, they also need to know companies' policies and understand what's expected of them. So this position is very much employee-facing and, and connecting with the employees. A lot of what I do regarding workplace culture is to start by building relationships with our employees. It's important that they have somewhere to go where they feel safe, heard, and supported. This makes managing conflicts and performance issues much easier when you've built those connections. Some challenges I'm facing currently is the stress levels of some employees. It's no surprise that the stress stretched budget has been the reason for short staffing levels, leaving fewer employees to maintain workloads, which may lead to burnout. New on the horizon for this position is to utilize my newly acquired mental health first aid certification to better assist and provide resources to those who may be dealing with mental health struggles. Additionally, I'm working on mainstreaming our evaluation processes to better assist department heads um, taking some of those pressures and deadlines off their plate, as well as working closely with the finance department to continue moving forward with the final touches on a better timekeeping system that will reduce the time it takes to perform the biweekly payroll process. And lastly, coming up to coming up in the next couple of months, I'm planning a workshop earmarked for all department heads and supervisors designed to provide strategies that can be used day to day to promote resilient leadership and to help with coaching and difficult conversations. Thank you. So this next slide um, is sort of an overview of the assessor's office. And so, you know, we've become very familiar with the assessor's office and the work that has just been done. So I won't belabor this too much, <laughs> but um, we've got the appraisal and reassessment, the maintenance of property, um, information, records, sales, tax maps, and the like, um, and then providing information. Um, and then it just gives kind of a listing of available records for review. And then Evelyn's going to maybe chime in here a little bit, just a guest appearance. Um, oh, perfect. Can everybody hear me okay? Yep. Great. Um, Evelyn Prim, communications coordinator. So um, I began in this position in the summer of 2022. And so uh, that quote that's on the top there is basically set in motion my guiding philosophy for what my work entails. Um, you've heard me um, present um, a bunch of different things, but basically I'm responsible for the day-to-day -day communications as well as um, helping orient the vision of communications within the city. And as you can see, I tried to illustrate um, using um, Bill's excellent metaphor of the uh, airplane, um, which I need to correct my math on a little bit of that. But um, you can see the foundational elements is the press releases, website maintenance, things like that. Um, and then as you move up um, the vision and towards the vision and mission, which is what the strategic communications plan is all about that you have in your packet. Um, I won't go into detail on that because it's pretty, it's pretty lengthy, um, but that has been a document that I've been working on since I started here. So it is basically the culmination of everything that has gone into this work in communication, and it also outlines the vision of where we want to go. So just like your strategic plan outlines your uh, the policy um, vision for the city, the strategic communications plan outlines um, where we want 
the, the basically the, the reason that I'm here, why I'm here and where we want to go with communications. And my hope is that if I were to be hit by a bus tomorrow, somebody could pick up that document and take over seamlessly from where I left off. Um, so it's, it's part manual, part uh, staff policy document. Um, a little bit of everything goes in there. Um, and I'm happy to, to explain um, and answer questions on that when we, um, when we get to it. So just um, in numbers, we have just have sort of the, the two departments rep represented here. So we've got the city manager's office, which is a $693,000 or so um, for FY25, and then the assessor's office, um, which is $203,000. And you can see the ups associated in those budgets year over year. So as we go forward, uh, as we think about the specific work our offices do, but also managing the entire city, obviously um, a number one issue in terms of the, the our office's work, not the city's issue, uh, certainly budget pressure and revenue loss, trying to keep doing what we're doing and the, the demands, you know, tonight we just heard appropriately that we should be putting $250,000 into our housing trust fund and so that you know if we were to do that that's a budget pressure right so maintaining our adequate service levels increased cost flood recovery of course has really refocused a lot of our work most of our work uh and, and then our opportunities our ability to leverage resources seek grants uh focus on core services i think that's really what we have to do because that's what people expect a year in year out and continue strategic investments in housing and infra infrastructure that's really what we've been focused on, you know, the most. So what's up next? Uh, flood recovery, of course, big uh, invest in and followed quickly by infrastructure and housing. I think those are really going to be the themes for our next year or two. And of course, I was thinking we'd be talking about this, you know, when you approved your strategic plan tonight. But when, when you do, we'll be uh, uh, implementing those initiatives and laying that out. Uh, that is the the blueprint for our work uh, now in the next few years. And lastly, just continue providing excellent services. I think so, I, I kind of harp on this, but we spend a lot of time in this room talking about policy and moving forward in important directions and really big things that we need to do. But but if you remember the iceberg from my presentation, you know, a lot of what city does is responding to those calls and plowing the roads and taking the ambulance and running the rec programs and all the things that people count on. And so it's, those are the things that don't, that usually only make it into this room if something's gone badly with them. If it's going well, it's not controversial. You're not hearing about them. So uh, that is really what we try to do. And that is the summary of our admin proposal. I think finance is that on here as well. Is that going to be reset up? Thanks. Okay. Reset. Thanks, Bill and Kelly. While you're getting set up, I'm going to comment that I'm I'm looking at council members' faces around the table. And um, it makes me think that maybe we should also put off the strategic communications plan. <laughs> I know I, I I tend to stay up later than a number of other people on the council. And so let's do that. I'll be quick. So about the finance department, um, excluding Tanya, who's kind of lumped in both city manager and finance, um, I, including myself, currently have 5.3 FTE and employees um, to work in the finance department. Um, that number doesn't include the vacant admin position that we have left vacant the majority of this fiscal year and has been eliminated in 25. Um, so going into 25, I will be continuing to be down that position and working to um, adjust the department in a way that we can manage all things effectively and provide the service people are accustomed to. 
Um, this is just a quick overview of the finance and technology expenditures that I manage. Um, finance is primarily made up of payroll, the audit, and our various accounting softwares. And then technology is primarily VC3 and other related tech purchases like the Adobe that we use. Um, uh, just on what finance does, they won't go through all of these, but I'll hit the high points. Uh, we accurately manage and record over $31.5 million in budgeted expenditures and revenues annually. That doesn't include the grant expenses we track and revenue we record. Right now, we are actively managing about $13 million in open grants, and that does not include FEMA, um, which is likely to be another $11 million plus in um, federal grant money we will be managing and reporting on regularly. Um, right now, that grant tracker has about 68 plus or minus open grants on it um, that we're working through. Um, I also um, build and maintain the annual budget and keep a close eye on that. We um, make sure all year-end adjustments are prepared. We have an annual audit um, where we get feedback and the stamp of approval on our books. We also work to, with them to prepare our financial statements that get published every year and then submitted to different reporting agencies. Bi-weekly, we work to enter and review all of the warrant documentation for proper coding and approval to be sure um, all of our expenditures are eligible and have um, all I's dotted, T's crossed. We also maintain a significant quantity of fixed assets and manage a significant amount of debt um, annually. The other thing we do, um, a significant amount of is billing. We bill annually for tax bills. There's other billing that's monthly, quarterly, biannually, and we manage those receivables to ensure they're collected in a timely manner. Um, we also um, are responsible for managing the cash flow of the city, which has been difficult in light of our current circumstances, um, but it is something that we stay on top of regularly to make sure bills are covered and employees are paid. Um, Tanya already spoke previously in the presentation, but finance and um, HR overlap. We process biweekly payroll for 100 to 150 employees, depending on the season. Um, as she mentioned, we just made a considerable investment in time into a time and attendance software to help track employee time better and make processing of payroll more efficient given we will be um, down one staff member going into 25. So I think that this will help us um, turn around payroll and free up maybe time for other um, things that we normally spent processing. We also do quarterly and annual tax filings and retire retirement remittance. So it is a pretty hefty workload between um, HR and payroll in the finance section. Um, the challenges we face, obviously, um, are staffing. We manage a significant quantity of money, and we want to make sure that it's all accounted for properly. So, um, you know, being down, the position is tough, but I think that that's something through a restructuring of the finance department I can accommodate for and uh, manage accordingly. We also, right now, are operating in multiple accounting systems, which has posed a challenge, but the investment in a new accounting system is significant. Um, we're operating in a school ERP, not a municipal ERP, and we're also having to use NEMRIC for tax and utility billing, and those systems don't talk to each other, so there's a lot of back and forth. Um, so there's some, you know, inefficiencies there that are um, troublesome to overcome. One of those is um, trying to establish the new stormwater utility. We are having some issues with the account structure that's set up in NEMRIC for water and sewer billings and how it is compatible with the tax billing system. So there's just some nuance there that having multiple accounting systems and neither meant for municipality or size um, pose as troublesome. And then the uh, biggest challenge I face is FEMA. Um, they are um, sticklers for all things, document, 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 and follow the rules. And I think I've read their Pop G for FEMA guidance three times, and it's like 270 pages plus <laughs> additional supplemental guidance because nobody seems to be an expert. So somebody <laughs> needs to be even uh, FEMA included. So um, we are on our fourth and fifth PDMG uh, to help manage these projects. I hope the one we have settled on now is in it for the long haul and we can start moving some projects ahead and not um, reliving the event over and over again with new FEMA reps. Um, I do think um, it is becoming more promising. And so, you know, I do look forward to 
jumping the FEMA hoops to someday not be in them. <laughs> um, but uh, really looking ahead, um, we've got some vital financial policies that are outdated. And I'm to me, those are really important related to procurement. And there's a lot of guidance out there um, that's available. It's just about finding the time and updating the policies. Um, there's nothing wrong with ours. They're just out of date and, and could use some more um, work. I also mentioned the stormwater utility integration. That's uh, troublesome, but is I'm working that problem too. So we'll figure out how we can get that lifted and and managed in the current systems we have. And then the FY24 audit is set to begin this September. We've scheduled them for mid-September. So that should put us on track for an audit report out in December or January this year instead of around town meeting. And then we will begin the budget build in October, likely sooner um, for FY26. So lots ahead, um, lots of challenges, but that's what I signed up for. So here we are. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Okay. Does anyone have any que questions about Sarah's presentation or any of the rest of them? Today's my vacation <laughs> day, actually. <laughs> actually, on vacation today. I'm just saying. I'm uh -huh. told not to come. Uh, okay. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, that was that was very yeah, uh, the screen. very helpful. Um, so next up, update on DPW negotiations. Or we have it? Do we have an update? Um, we do, but should I we guess, go into? Well, we could, session? but I can I can maybe keep it really short if I mm -hmm. ask one question. Um, if people saw the email, the memo I sent out summarizing where we were and where we might propose, and if anybody had, if people are okay with what I said in there, then we're good because that's kind of the direction things are heading. If people have real concerns, then I'd be happy to. But as long as I'm good to work within those parameters, then I think we almost settled on yesterday. We came really close. So I think we're almost there, but I I would want to, you know, there was a couple of things we're hung up on. Um, and, and without getting into the details, one is, you know, we're trying to formalize the night shift. So, so mm -hmm. that's, you know, they don't love that. So how do we make that work? But it certainly is a good thing. So there you go. But there's still every reason to think we'll have it in place yeah, by, yeah, for, by the 1st of July. I think, well, yeah, we have one more meeting set for the 25th or something like that. Right. So, so, okay. Could have a last minute tentative agreement for the June 26 meeting, potentially. All right. So we don't. Gary. I, I, I don't want to make a stay any longer, but we were supposed to get a city clerk update oh, as oh, well. Sorry. That's right. And I do think it's really important. He didn't that's jump. okay. We can skip. No, no, no we're not going to skip you. Uh, thank you, Gary. Yes, thank you. Okay, I'll be so fast. Five minutes. I'm a leaf on the wind. All right, let me share my screen here. Figure out which screen to share. There we go. It's even right there on the page. It's uh, yeah, right yeah, yeah. I know. I know how it is. Okay, wait a minute. How do I start? Shoot. All right. Well, I'm not seeing the start slideshow oh it's way over here That's mm -hmm. the problem. okay this is me i am your friendly neighborhood city clerk that means i am an elected bureaucrat which is a, a unique thing um i exist because i'm elected i'm outside the regular city hierarchy which means nobody has to listen to me and i don't have to listen to them so it's all a good deal um, this is us in the office. Uh, there's two of us. And I'm going to brag a little here because the town's uh, immediate population immediately below us and above us, Barrytown and Winooski, they both separate their clerk and treasurer too. And their clerk staffs are each three. We are two. I'm a certified municipal clerk from the International Institute of Municipal Clerks, got a certificate in election administration from the University of Minnesota. I'm also a certified ethical hacker and a certified network defense architect, which I get a, a lot of mileage off of. 
Sarah, my deputy, is also a certified municipal clerk and formerly served as clerk for the towns of Duval, Newcastle, and Yarrow Point in Washington and Driggs, Idaho, and is a former reporter. So between the two of us, we are honestly the most experienced and and we're a great staff okay i'm eating through my five minutes quick um this is a list generally of what we do um city council i'm the secretary handle all the land records land deeds vital records make them available archive some old stuff we're supposed to keep like grand lists and chattel mortgages we handle the work on the abatements process process request you all know all about that uh, licensing, dog licensing, marriage licenses, business licenses, so the property tax appeals we coordinate and I staff and support the Board of Civil Authority and the Board of Abatement. Then we do elections, which uh, this is, I think, why I am independently elected and not answerable to y'all because you can be on the ballot um, and I'm a separate person. So anyways, recounts, that means volunteer recruitment and management um, oh, I misspelled some things in there, but I do those too. And the other public facing duties are things like state park passes. I help with taking payments and parking tickets with the finance department. We're the first point of contact for citizens. So I have to smile a lot. Um, and we're an information resource. So I'm almost done. I'm so close here. So this, I made this a long time ago. I don't remember exactly what I'm looking at here. But this is the uh, amount of the budget that's not public safety. And I just want to give you all a sense of where we are in terms of the percentage of that we use. Way down here, 2.8% between the assessor and tree management. So we have a very low budgetary impact, but I think city's getting an awful lot of bang for its buck. Our historical budget here, I've managed to just barely continue to keep it under 200,000. You can see over the last few years, the red is really not fair because I have a discrete fund that I can spend for prop or for uh, uh, keeping records indefinitely and taking care of records. And I tapped into that shows on my budget. Not fair. There's not really an overspending. But you can see where it dropped down the pandemic when I was working without my deputy for a while, dropped down again in 22 when I worked without a deputy for a while. But anyways, we keep up keep a pretty tight budget, even though costs and expenses have gone way up for elections and such. Uh, that's it. Questions, thoughts, suggestions, you, anecdotes. You forgot to mention the uh, historical uh, museum that you've got in your... Uh... Oh, which has been scrunched down to now just a nice historical collection, but because uh, we're running out of space. But uh, I've got all kinds of things to come in and look at. There are old Civil War letters, old water pipes... The, the charter, just come in and visit. Yeah, it, cool stuff. Did yeah. I do five minutes? Was that five minutes? Sure, close enough. All right. Thank you. 5.3. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And um, we're happy with the DPW thing, I think. Oh, I don't yeah. think anyone asked for... Mm -hmm. Yep. We don't have other business. Time for council reports. Let's start at your end. Adrian. Nothing. Tim. Palin. Um, yeah, um, this Friday, um, class of 2024 at high school, um, they are graduating. And one of them is my daughter. And it is hard to believe she's 18. <laughs> And I can see that she's 18, all her attitude and everything, but it is still hard to believe. And I just want to congratulate them because they have been through so many things because of the COVID. And it started when they were in the middle school and they lost like two years. And it was a huge emotional uh, challenge for them, but they did it and they are graduating um, this Friday. And I also... I want to remind them if any of them is watching us, it will be great if they register as voters and they can just like uh, vote in the next uh, local and uh, general elections because we need our youth, uh, our next generation to be part of our democracy. So thank you. And anyone who is not 18 yet, but is going to turn 18 by November, 
can register to vote now and vote in the primary. Thank you. Um, I have a few things to mention. It seems like it's been a long time since we've, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, no, Lauren's off. Uh, Lauren, uh, Lauren hung on as long as she could and finally uh, left us. Um, it seems like a long time since we've met. Uh, since we've met, uh, one of the things that I've done is that on May 30th, we had a visit from the uh, Romanian ambassador to the United States and uh, a number of his staff people. And I was totally surprised when I got an email from the assistant to the uh, Romanian ambassador and Bill was sure that it was some kind of scam and it was actually someone pretending to be a Nigerian prince. But uh, but the ambassador from Romania is engaged in this uh, process of uh, meeting with the mayors of all the capital cities in the United States. And, uh, and so it was... Uh, I wasn't a hundred percent sure what he wanted to talk about, but it, uh, Bill was away that day, so it was uh, me and uh, Kelly and John and Evelyn, and uh, we talked about a lot of things that uh, that we're addressing as this tiny little state capital, and I don't think they really were aware of how tiny Montpelier is, but. Uh, doing that and uh and their country and we've got a lot of things we could we could talk about that were similar things including what they're doing with their uh <clears throat> net zero goals and our net zero goal um talking about uh how how we finance infrastructure and how they finance infrastructure um are my uh, pleasure at supporting at agreeing with them for their support uh, for Ukraine and taking in uh, many thousands of Ukrainian refugees. They share a 400 mile border uh, with Ukraine. And they also told us that they uh, paid a quick visit to the uh, capital cannabis across the street. And they thought that was a novelty because the ideology over in Romania is very much against cannabis or any other uh, recreational drug. So it was, it was a, I, I would also point out, they all spoke English very well. So, so it was an interesting uh, couple of hours and it was definitely worth doing. I also want to graduate or congratulate the high school graduates and uh, all their teachers and all their parents. It's it's kind of a long time since my kids were doing the same thing, but uh, but it's great. Um, the uh, you probably have all noticed we've got trees being planted out uh, out on Main Street. Uh, by the end of the week, we will probably see a, a new Elm Street and oak oak elm tree and oak tree out in uh, in front of uh, Walgreens and the BFW. Um, part of a process we've been through for years of uh, bringing in new trees as uh, in anticipation of having to replace all the uh, ash trees in the city. And finally, I'll just point out that uh, I recently received a copy of the uh, audit from the Montpelier Housing Authority. We don't have any supervisory control over the Montpelier Housing Authority, but although we do appoint uh, the members of the board, and uh, once again we uh, they got a clean audit, no notes, um, and it just demonstrates the continued uh, good management by the executive director and the and the board. Um, and so congratulations to them. And that's all I've got. City manager. Um, skipping me again. I'm not Jeez. skipping you. It's I'm the oh, theme sorry. Of the night. Go ahead. Sorry, John. Right. Water bills due Monday. Is that it? Yep.
All right. All right. City manager. I have very little except to, uh, it has been a while. Uh, uh, so number one, the, the list that's been posted, the preliminary list for June 26 may have some shuffling. So, uh, because of the things we put off, so be, keep your eyes up for that. Um, but the reason I wasn't at uh, getting to meet with the Romanian uh, prime minister, uh, the ambassador, excuse me, was that I had gone to Maine to present to the central uh, greater Portland Council of Governments about sustainability and particularly flood recovery. And it was a wonderful event, saw some folks I knew, drove over and back, it was a beautiful day. But they, in, in conjunction with that event, that group created about an eight-minute video. Um, Tim's in it, I'm in it, Katie Trouts. I don't know if you've all seen it, but if you haven't, you should, because they did a really professional job, and it really brought back a lot of the imagery and the feelings, and uh, it was really top-notch effort. So I highly advise, if you haven't seen it, to see it, and if you want me to send it to you, I can. Um, and that's all I've got. Oh, and I want to just remind members of the city council next Wednesday, June 19th is our uh, council outing to, uh, to see the Mountaineers. Um, council. I, I, yeah, I think we, I think we can do both. The police department tour is supposed to. Sure. It's supposed to, we, we can. We'll talk to Kelly uh, or somebody about moving it. Yeah, but at any rate, um, just get out there and as how quick you are, get them through. Cheer on the guys. And with that, we are adjourned at 10.53 p.m. <laughs>